All righty, we are down to it. This is our last lecture uh, for the fourth part of the class, uh, and that is the muscular system. It's Thursday, April 8th, 2021. Uh, we have talked about almost everything you could possibly want to for skeletal muscle. So we're almost done with skeletal muscle. We just have one tiny little thing I have to go over, and that's the fact that I've been lying to you this whole entire time. Uh, and then once we cover that, then we'll finally get a chance to briefly talk about uh, smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, talking about the similarities and the differences in them uh, between everything we've learned about skeletal muscle and how they function both similarly and differently from uh, skeletal muscle. And then the rest of our class time we'll use to finish off the origins, insertions, and actions of the muscles of the leg. We've gotten through most of the stuff on our list. We just have a handful more we need to do, and we should be able to get that done in the time provided for us today. All right, if there's any additional time at the end, as always, I will happily uh, do a question and answer review. Again, review is an opportunity for you to ask me questions, uh, not for me to tell you what I think is important. That's what I do every day in class. Uh, because Tuesday, after the long weekend, you guys have uh, your first, uh, your fourth, I should say, a lab and lecture exam. All right, so that is the game plan. Questions on any of that? Excellent. Black boxes, stunned silences, everything I love from a class. That was sarcasm, by the way. All right, excellent. I have a quick question. Yes. So the book provides a ton of pictures of both. Um, I mean, a lot of them are not real photographs of muscles or like cadavers or whatever. Are, is the exam going to have a lot of pictures that are artistic or is it going to have a lot of like real bodies? So I, it will not have cadavers. Uh, what it will primarily be is either illustrations from a textbook or pictures of models or things along those lines. Uh, being able to identify muscles on a cadaver. I mean, obviously there's some obvious muscles, but for the most part, it can be very challenging, more than we're expecting you to be able to do in something like this. So it will be more obvious examples like the charts, like the models, like the other materials that are available for you. Okay, thank you. Yep. All righty. And again, bones, remember you are going to be responsible as much as uh, a third, not quite a third, maybe 30%, it's close to a third, uh, of the exam could be pictures of bones with uh, the attachment points labeled. And you need to tell me what originates or inserts from those as well. So don't remember that, don't forget that that's gonna be on there as well. All righty. <clears throat> as I mentioned, now for the big lie. We have been talking about skeletal muscle uh, and skeletal muscle cells as if it is just one thing. But that'd be kind of like talking about cartilage as if it was one thing. Yes, cartilage is a thing. It is a type of connective tissue. But if you remember, there are actually three specific types of cartilage. And while all three types have uh, many similarities, there are also some differences between them as well. And it turns out the exact same thing is true for skeletal muscle. With skeletal muscle, while what we've been talking about is true for all or most of the skeletal muscle, there are actually three main types. Uh, main specific types, let's say it that way, just to be consistent with what we did, like, for instance, with our connective tissues. Uh, there's three specific, why is this so small and green? There we go. Excellent. Uh, three specific types of skeletal muscle fibers. So your book's got a nice table that goes over them, uh, but we will go over them as well. And these skeletal muscle fibers, again, remember, we're still talking about skeletal muscle. We're not talking about the differences between smooth and cardiac. We are talking about skeletal muscle cells. These three types of skeletal muscle cells differ in several ways. One way that they differ is in their diameter. And notice in parentheses there, it says strength of contraction. Why? Why does the diameter of the muscle cell affect the strength of the contraction? Wouldn't fatter mean it has more of those myofibrils and skinny exactly. mean less? Exactly. Uh, more diameter, you're, that's actually a perfect way of describing it. More diameter. Uh, means 
more myofibrils. And if you, of course, if you have more myofibrils, then that means you have more myosin and more actin. And that of course means more power strokes, which of course means a greater strength of contraction. Absolutely, so you nailed that on the head. So again, the more proteins it has inside of it, the stronger the muscle cell is going to be. Uh, remember we talked about how a myosin head on average uh, undergoes a contractile cycle. Well, let's say it this way, five undergoes five contractile cycles. Uh, per second, All right? So we said that that was, again, the average, and we talked about how incredibly fast and impressive that would be to be able to do that. But again, we didn't emphasize it at the time, but the key word in that sentence was not the actual five per second, but the on average. Because as it turns out, there are two different types of myosin heads. Some myosin heads that are slower and some myosin heads that are faster. And if you have a muscle cell that has slow myosin heads, how does that affect the speed of the contraction? It's slow. A slow contraction, there you go. And fast myosin heads give us a fast contraction. So again, the speed of the contraction or really the speed of the myosin heads is a second way these are different. I have a quick question. Yes. I think I missed something. What determines how fast or slow myosin heads would contract? They're just different types. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep, just like they're different types of ice cream, chocolate and vanilla. All right. Only those two, but they're still different, still different different types. It's the same thing with myosin heads. Some are vanilla, some are chocolate. All right. Now remember, yes, Laurie, you had a question. All right, just to touch off of a Yulia's question. Um, is it so you can't, so there's a snow and so and flat fast ones. Does it, dip, is that depending on like how fast it splits from ATP to ADP or is that like something completely different? Uh, no, it, uh, great question. It more has to do uh, um, from a molecular component when you look at the molecules of them. Basically the primary thing that is different in them is their pivot speed. Okay. how quickly they undergo their power stroke. That's the primary place where we see the difference, right? A chemical reaction like splitting ATP isn't something that we can really easily do slow or fast, mm -hmm. right? Uh, binding to an ATP isn't something that terribly goes slow and fast. So the primary difference between these at a molecular standpoint, which again, this has been studied, but it isn't something we have to worry about. But the short version of the answer is basically, it is primarily the speed of their power strokes that determine whether they're fast or slow and make them faster or slower. Okay, thank you. Yep, no, it's a great question. All right, excellent. Someone remind me again what myoglobin does? Store. Yeah, stores oxygen, All right? And we talked about how mus skeletal muscle cells have a lot of it. Well, it turns out that's not entirely true. Skeletal muscle cells can contain different amounts of myoglobin, All right? Now, myoglobin, oops, oops, if I spell myoglobin right. Myoglobin is similar to hemoglobin. Where do we find hemoglobin again? Blood. blood. Where specifically in the blood? The red blood cells? Yeah. Because they're red when they're oxygenated. Exactly, and that's why. That hemoglobin has a heme group, and that heme group has an iron uh, um, uh, atom in it. And uh, when oxygen binds to that atom, it gives it a reddish color. So oxygen binds to the iron. And when it binds to the iron, we get that reddish color of the red uh, blood cells. You get the reddish color of the rust on the Studebaker you've got on, you know, on stilts in front of your house. And it turns out the same thing here in the muscle cells as well. Muscle cells that have lots of myoglobin tend to have a darker or reddish color and are referred to as red fibers. Whereas those that have very little 
right, are uh, typically referred to uh, are lighter in color and referred to as wider fibers. And while you might not have ever thought of the myoglobin content of a skeletal muscle before in your entire life, it is something that you may have possibly dealt with this past weekend. Because while many people will have ham for Easter, there are lots of other people that have turkey. And if you had turkey for Easter, what was the big question you got asked while you were sitting around the table? I've never been asked that question. Never been asked that? Yes, you have. Everybody's been asked that question. Because when you sit down and they hold the plate of turkey in front of you, what do they ask you? Oh, do you want the thigh or leg or I don't know? Well, light meat, dark meat. There you go. Are you a white, are you a, a light meat or a, or a dark meat person? All right. Light meat and dark meat, those differences in the composition of the muscle that we see when we look at their tone, when we look at their color is do, I don't know. I know nobody probably eats turkey for Easter, but again, I, Thanksgiving's too far away. So I had to use Easter as an example, but either way, one of the big questions is white meat or dark meat, right? Do you want the breast and the wings? Do you want the legs or the thighs? That difference in color is due to the different co composition of myoglobin. <laughs> legs dark meat. All right, excellent. Uh, muscle cells can vary in the blood supply that they have coming to them. Right, so again, some of them could have a larger blood supply, larger capillary. What's the advantage of having a larger blood supply when that muscle is active? More oxygen. Yeah, we can get more oxygen to it. We'll get less tired during contractions. That is one of the potential implications, right? The more oxygen we have, the more we can make our ATP aerobically and don't have to do it anaerobically, don't have to produce the lactic acid. Whereas if you have a smaller blood supply, then you're typically that muscle is getting less oxygen when it is active. Notice we have the oxygen stored. We have oxygen coming to it from a capillary. Yes, question. Yeah, so um, the white versus red meat of turkey is has to do with myoglobin content. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, I just wasn't sure. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about the specific types. We'll see this in action. All right. Again, this is something you haven't thought of before, but I know it's something you're all aware of. Muscle cells can also vary in the amount of mitochondria they have as well. So notice we can have a lot of oxygen stored in it, a lot of oxygen coming to it, in which case we would probably want a lot of mitochondria. If we don't have a lot of myoglobin to store oxygen, if we have a small blood supply, it doesn't do the cell a lot of good to have a mito lot of mitochondria because there's no oxygen for them to do the work. So the more oxygen we have coming to this, the more mitochondria we're going to need. And as you guys hit it on the head, all of these things are going to affect our ability to produce ATP. And when we talk about these muscle cells and their ability to produce ATP, uh, we identify them by two different flavors. Oxidative, where they primarily use aerobic respiration, and glycolytic, where they prob pr primarily use anaerobic respiration. So with these characteristics in mind, what we can do is we can talk about the three main types, clear all of that, of muscle fibers. The first and the most common, and actually let's do this here on our whiteboard. The first type is what we call fast glycolytic fibers. These fibers are the most common. And again, uh, let's do this just to emphasize. 
this down a little. Oops. I need to do that. Again, I want to emphasize, because we're going to talk about other stuff today as well. These are all three specific types of skeletal muscle fibers. So again, I want to make sure we remember that we are just still just talking about skeletal muscle cells. All right. Fast glycolytic is our most common type. It is the one that is also largest in diameter. And what does that also tell us? It's the strongest. Right. Strongest contractions. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Uh, so it's the largest in diameter. And let's see, we can figure a lot out from their names. Fast, what do you think the fast refers to? The speed of contraction. Right, the speed of contraction. And what determines the speed of the contraction? The myosin. slow of the fast myosin. Yeah, exactly. So this one, of course, has fast myosin heads and produces a fast contraction. Excellent. So let's get to the second part of the name. <coughs> Glycolytic. What does that refer to? Has high storage of glycogen. Need well, for okay. glycogen that it powers through glycogen. Well, remember uh, back when we were talking about it before, uh, when we talked about our muscle cells, we referred to them as being uh, glycolytic or what was the other type? Uh, oxid oxidative. Oxidative, excellent. And that referred to how they primarily make ATP. So for the glycolytic, glycolytic primarily makes ATP how? Aerobically or anaerobically? Anaerobically. Yeah. So it primarily produces ATP anaerobically, right? That means without oxygen, right? Now, if that is the case, do you think it has a, a large amount of myoglobin or a small amount of myoglobin? Not sure about that. Yeah. In fact, uh, because of that, these fast glycolytic fibers are often referred to as our white fibers. Uh, do they uh, need a large capillary supply or a small capillary supply? A large amount? Well, but remember that when we're exercising, the capillary system primarily is there to bring oxygen. Does this one necessarily need a massive amount of oxygen? No. No. no, so typically, and again, there are always exceptions, but typically a smaller capillary system. And what about the number of mitochondria that it's going to have? Also small. Yeah. Low number. So notice this muscle, and I don't have, I didn't really leave myself a lot of room here. So I'll stink this into the bottom. I'll stink this in up here. This one here produces a fast and powerful contraction, right? However, if it is producing ATP primarily anaerobically, is this a type of activity that will be able to be sustained for a prolonged period of time? No. No, it, because this does not efficiently use ATP, this type of muscle cell typically fatigues rapidly. 
So it's a fast, powerful contraction, but a dynamic movement, but it's one that can't be uh, sustained for a long period of time. So what types of movements would this allow us to do? Powerful, like fast movements, like something very quickly. Right, sprinting, jumping, right? Throwing a ball, throwing a punch, power, lifting a weight, rapid, powerful movements that are not sustained for a prolonged period of time. All right. All right, let's move on to our next type. The second type is a slow oxidative. Completely different name, practically the opposite of the one we just talked about. Now, uh, the fast glycolytic are the largest in diameter, slow oxidative are the smallest in diameter. Right. And of course, what does that indicate for us? Slow contractions. Well, not, not so much small, slower, although we'll get to slower, but weaker contractions, right? Because it's the smallest in diameter, it has the fewest proteins, uh, it has the weakest contractions. But you're right, it's also the slow refers to our slow myosin heads. And of course, those slow high myosin heads mean it is going to produce a slow contraction. So while the first one produced very fast and powerful contractions, notice our slow oxidative uh, produces slower and weaker contractions. However, there's the second half to our name here oxidative. And what does that indicate? It does require oxygen for ATP synthesis. Exactly. It primarily makes uh, ATP aerobically. Uh, and that means with oxygen. Excellent. Now, if this one is going to primarily rely on uh, oxygen for making its ATP, how much myoglobin do we need here? Large amounts. Yeah. We need lots of myoglobin. All right. We need uh, a large capillary supply. And we need lots of mitochondria. These, with their large amount of myoglobin, are what we refer to as the red fibers. Now, this is producing a slower and a weaker contraction, but because it's producing its ATP aerobically, it is very efficient at its breaking down of the, of the glucose to make ATP. So while this is a slower and weaker contraction, this is a contraction that can be sustained for a much longer period of time. So this one is typically fatigue resistant. So it produces a slower, weaker contraction that we can use for a much longer period of time. What are some of the activities that we might be able to use this for? Long distance running or something? Well, probably not long distance running, but definitely walking or standing, activities like that, absolutely. All right. Let's go back to our friend, the turkey. Where is the white meat on the turkey? Like in the breast <clears throat> and more like around the body. Yeah, breast in the wings. Where is the dark meat? In the legs. In the legs and the thighs, absolutely. How does a turkey primarily get around? By walking. By walking, absolutely. Is it capable of flying? No. Also, we don't know. I'm just kidding. Turkeys can actually fly. They can fly up into a tree, for instance, to nest for the night, uh, fly over fences, things along those lines. They are capable of a short duration flight, producing a fast, powerful contraction with their wings. 
uh, to fly, but it's not their primary way of getting around. Their primary way of getting around is walking. Yeah, typically when I run at them with my car, they run, they don't fly away. True, because that is their primary way of getting around, <laughs> absolutely. And don't chase turkeys with your car. Um, excellent. Uh, okay. So fatigue resistant for standing things along those lines. How many people here have eaten duck before? Anyone? Yeah, for Christmas. Okay, excellent. Typically when you eat duck, what part of the duck do you eat? Mainly the breast. The breast, excellent. And when you looked at that breast meat of the duck, does it look like the breast of the chicken or does it look more like the thigh of the chicken? It's, it's dark. darker. It is a dark meat, absolutely. Because unlike that turkey, what is the duck's primary way of getting around? Flying. And swimming? Um, Flying, oh. absolutely. Duck's primary way of getting around is flying. So they need to be able to sustain those prolonged activities of their wings. So they need that uh, red meat, that dark meat, that fatigue resistant uh, muscle cells uh, in their arms, in their chest, in their wings to be able to maintain them, right? So very, very different from turkeys. So what are we? Are we turkeys or are we ducks? Turkeys. We are turkeys, absolutely. Our primary way of getting around is standing. Yeah, chicken's the same way. Um, all right, we can stand for hours. You know, everything is walking distance if you have time. But as we talked about before, how long can you hold yourself in a planking position for? Not that long. Yeah, not that long. And, and really, you're not even uh, holding up all of your weight when you're planking. Right, so you can throw that ball 100 miles an hour, but we can't sustain that contraction for a prolonged period of time. <laughs> yes, that is why humans taste funny. Yes, you didn't know that. Um, all right, excellent. Questions on that? All right. Notice, though, we've got space here. I had someone asking a private question. Uh, so, and, and I will bring it up, actually, because someone brought it up, and I don't want anybody else to be confused by it. It appears that the book, uh, do you have the most recent version of the book? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the book, the table on the book says that it is this third one we're about to identify, the fast oxidative, which are the largest, but that just information is not correct. Uh, so uh, go by what I'm saying, what is here, this is accurate. And I'm, and I'm guessing uh, that it's probably just a typo on the table. If you actually read uh, in the chapter where it talks about it, my guess is that they will have it right there. So my guess is they maybe made that mistake on the table because, um, but even if they didn't, since I write the tests, I would go with what I say. And, but again, it is what it is. I'm not making this up. It, the fast glycolytic are the largest. All right, but that does bring us to our third type, and that is the fast oxidative. Fast oxidative are intermediate cells. They're obviously not the largest, they're not the smallest, so they are intermediate in size, meaning they produce an intermediate strength contraction. What type of myosin heads do we have with fast oxidative? Uh, yeah, so fast myosin heads, therefore fast contraction. But notice functionally, they're called oxidative, but even that is a little bit, um, tricky because what's special about these fast oxidative fibers is they are actually able to 
equally produce ATP both with and without oxygen. So they are equally able uh, to, a, to be able to produce ATP both with oxygen and without oxygen. So they're kind of, again, intermediate in between. They have an intermediate amount of myoglobin. What does that make them color-wise? Red or pink? Yeah, they're pink color, absolutely, because they're not quite uh, filled with myoglobin like the reds. They're not empty of myoglobin like the white. So these are our pink fibers. Uh, intermediate uh, blood supply. Uh, intermediate uh, mitochondria. And while they can produce a relatively fast contraction, they are going to be fatigue resistant. These are going to be useful for the things like jogging, right? Or leisurely swimming in a pool. I'm not talking about doing laps, but, you know, getting from one side of the pool to other things along those lines. All right. So we've done it here on the board. Let's go here and do it again. again. I wasn't done yet. Could I, oh. could I go back to the previous for just a second? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thousand one. So what would be an example of the fast glycolytic? Fast glycolytic? Well, so, so here, let's think of it this way. The other, there's two important things to remember. And we kind of talked about this before uh, when we were talking about chucking it all and working out. As I mentioned, if every single one of us lifts the exact same amount of weights, the exact same number of times for the exact same number of days, are we all gonna see the exact same amount of growth? No. And one of the main reasons for that is almost all of the muscles of our body, and that's not a bad thing to write in here. Almost all the muscles of our body are a mix of all three types of these muscle cells. Now, evenly distributed, does every muscle get exactly 10 of each of these or something like that? No, it's not gonna be evenly distributed, uh, but almost all the muscles in our body are a mix of all three. However, different muscles in different areas have more of some than others. So like we talked about, the chest, pectoralis major, uh, the bicep brachia, those type have more fast glycolytic fibers, allowing us to throw that ball or throw that punch or throw that javelin, right? Do some type of powerful motion uh, that typically isn't sustained for a long period of time. Whereas in our legs, we have more of the slow oxidative or, uh, or in our core, like an abdominal girdle, we have a lot of the slow oxidative in our abdominal girdle, helping to maintain the integrity, right? Sustained weak contractions to hold all of our, you know, wishy, squishy, gushy stuff in, right? Legs could have more of the fast oxidative, more of the pink and red fibers for standing, for walking, for things along those lines. But everybody has different amounts of these and that is determined genetically. All right, so that's why if we all worked out the same number of times with the same amount of weight, we're all not gonna see the same amount of gain. And the types of activities you do are going to dramatically affect your, act, your uh, um, uh, the amounts and the efficiency of these as well, all right? Usain Bolt, the Olympic uh, runner, right? Which of these three types does he primarily specialize in in his legs? Fast oxidative? Well, in this case, fast glycolytic, right? He wants those fast, powerful contractions that only have to last the less than 10 seconds it takes him to go 100 yards, all right? Meb, on the other hand, is also an Olympic runner. But what event does he run in? Marathons. Marathon. So for him, what type of fibers is he more specializing in? Fast oxidative. Yeah, the fast oxidative and even some of the slow oxidative in that fashion. Absolutely. And we can't quickly go from one type to the other. 
right? Usain Bolt can't decide tomorrow that he is going to become a world-class marathon runner and be able to do that in a month because he hasn't been special, you know, it's a combination of things. Obviously, he genetically has possibly more of the fast glycolytic fibers, which makes him that much stronger and that's much faster. But those are also the muscle cells that he's been specializing. All right, same thing for Meb. He can't decide tomorrow that he's going to become a sprinter because he's been specializing uh, his fast oxidative. Now, it isn't impossible to change types. In particular, as we use them, as we specialize them, it is possible that some of our slow oxidative can become more fast oxidative. But you can't easily switch between types. So there are some genetic constraints that no matter how many times you run sprints, while you'll improve, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to ever become an Olympian. All right. I know, Yulia, you raised your question a while, your hand a while ago, so I apologize for that. What was your question? Um, my question is actually very fast. So, um, oh, you must have added white fibers, red fibers. So white fibers are white because they don't have, because they, they work anaerobically. And then pink fibers have both, uh, both aerobic and anaerobic ability to get food. The I mean, name, get nutrients. The name you, white, red, and pink solely refer to the color of the cells based on the amount of myoglobin they have in them. Okay, and it has nothing to do with mitochondria or any, or blood well, supply. So hold on, so, so take a step. Um, the names white fiber, red fiber, and pink fiber are given these names based on the amount of myoglobin they have in it. White fibers have very little myoglobin. Red fibers have a lot of myoglobin. Pink fibers have an intermediate amount of intermediate amount of myoglobin. Okay, that's where they get the names. Period. End of story. However, you're absolutely correct. How much myoglobin a cell has is going to have a strong indication of how it's going to make its ATP. So yes, those that don't have a lot of myoglobin uh, are going to not use oxygen primarily to make their ATP. So they're more likely to be glycolytic. Those that have a lot of myoglobin are much more likely to be oxidative. So you're right. Um, how much myoglobin they have is going to affect how they make their ATP. But the names are based solely on the amount of myoglobin because it affects their color. Right when you look at that chicken, we both cooked and not cooked. Right, although it cooked, I think it's even more obvious when it's cooked. When you're looking at that turkey, when you're looking at that duck, there's a big difference between the appearance of the dark meat and the white meat, and those differences are because of the myoglobin content. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. All right. So now again. As we talked about, fast glycolytic are the large in diameter. There are white cells. Very few mitochondria produce ATP primarily anaerobically, right? Because they're so inefficient, they need a large glycogen store. They produce those fast contractions. They fatigue easily. And like we said, we use those for the intense types of movements. Again, no new information here. These are all things that we've already talked about. Slow oxidative, small in diameter, red cells, aerobic, slow contraction, fatigue resistant, endurance activities like walking, maintaining posture, things along those lines. And our fast oxidative, intermediate, 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 both aerobic and anaerobic, fast contraction, but fatigue resistant, right? So for intermediate types of activities like jogging and things along those lines. And again, as I mentioned, your book has this picture uh, that talks about their size. All right. And everything else about them. See, and uh, they must have changed it because notice here's my table. This is, I will say, from an earlier version of the book, I believe. But again, notice fiber diameter, fast glycolytic are the large. Slow, fast oxidative are the intermediate uh, and slow oxidative are the small. So Laurie, you're saying that your book says something different? Yeah, um, it says the opposite, that fast oxidative, oxidative was large and the fast glycolytic is intermediate. And I didn't want to um, 
confuse anyone. So no, I, I appreciate, but I appreciate you saying that because uh, if that is incorrect in the table on your textbook, that is something that other people looking at it later uh, could be confused about. Uh, so this table is the correct one. I apologize for that error. But here's the other thing. Think of it in terms of function, like we talked about. And as you can see here on the chart, right, the fast glycolytic are the ones that we're using for those short term, really intense, really powerful contractions, like hitting or throwing the baseball or throwing the punch or things along those lines, right? Fast, short term, intense, powerful, that 100 mile an hour fastball. If you're gonna throw a 100 mile an hour fastball, you need a big, large uh, muscle because more myosin means more power, right? So again, when we think of it in terms of its function, um, then, uh, then again, hopefully that helps us to understand that. All right. So again, I apologize for that. And I'm sure in the text of the, it says, uh, it says it correctly. So yes, the, how much the, their colors, when we talk about pink, white, and red, those nicknames for the three muscle cells that is based solely on the myoglobin content. And that's actually what you see here. This particular stain is a cross section through a muscle fascicle. We can see the fascicle here. And this particular stain stains uh, myoglobin content. So notice some of the cells in this fascicle have a very large amount of myoglobin in them. And the ones with a large amount of myoglobin are the slow oxidative. Some of these have an intermediate amount of myoglobin. These are the fast oxidative. And some of them have almost no myoglobin in them. And you can see that they, those are very light, almost white in color. And those are the fast glycolytic. Here we see a very nice up close view, but I love this picture, this one here, because it is a lower uh, magnification. So we can see a lot more of the fascicles. And we can see that again, inside of pretty much every fascicle, you have a mix of these different types. All right, we have right, the dark stained, slow oxidative, the intermediate stained, fast oxidative and the lightly stained fast glycolytic. Now, one last thing. Remember I mentioned almost every muscle in your body is a mix of all three of these types. Of course, the key word in that sentence is what? Most. Right, most, because most means not all. There are six muscles that move your eye in space, up, down, left, right, tilted inward, not bird, and all of that type of stuff. Uh, you don't have to actually know those for this exam, but I will tell you, you will be learning them in the next exam uh, in the nervous system. But the six muscles that move your eyes through space, those six muscles are pure fast glycolytic. They're the only pure muscles in your body made up solely of just one type of skeletal muscle cells. And they are all fast glycolytic. But every other muscle in your body, and again, as we talked about, you have over 600 nave muscles in your body, is some combination of these three types. Not equal, but some combination. Notice this one has a lot more of the slow oxidative. So this is much more likely to have come from the leg or something like that. All right. With that, where are we time loss? We are finally, finally done with everything we need to know about skeletal muscle. Excellent. So again, we are finally done with skeletal muscle. We've learned everything we need to learn about that. And now we finally can spend a little bit of time talking about smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. Now, we're not going to need as much time for this. And even though it is a little bit early, this is a good natural stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our first break here. We will restart in 15 minutes. So that'll be 105. And at 105, we will uh, start the recording at that point. 
And we will start first talking about smooth muscle and then briefly talk about cardiac muscle. We won't go too, too much into depth in either of these. Smooth muscle, you'll learn a lot more when we get to 431 and are talking things about the digestive system and things along those lines. And a cardiac muscle, you'll learn everything you wanted to know and more about that when we get to 431 and we're talking about the cardiovascular system. So really, uh, today is going to be a brief introduction to these things. Uh, so, so you have some basic information and basic understanding that we can use to relate to what we've learned in skeletal. All right. Any questions? So will the smooth and cardiac muscle we're learning right now, will that be on this exam, upcoming exam? Yes. No, so so yes, the the brief information that we will talk about here, you're absolutely responsible for on this exam. However, I'm just warning you, when you get to 431, we'll get even more in depth into it. Okay. But absolutely, for now, what we're doing, uh, we will, uh, you will, uh, we'll, the things that the, the few things that we talk about in class, you will be responsible for on the exam. Uh, yes, so this semester, I have both a 430 and a 431 class. Uh, sure. All right. Any other questions? All right. See you guys in 15 minutes.
Oh, Demetrio, looks like you're right. Well, when you guys are watching this, you'll get a nice 15 minutes of zen. Get a little uh, yoga time. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Tell me what you know about or remember about smooth muscle tissue, microscopically. It's non-striated. Excellent, non-striated. It has, it has like a spindle shape. Spindle shape, excellent. It's involuntary, so it's controlled by the autonomic system, motor system. And it's smallest in cells. Yep. Uh, controlled by autonomic nervous system and something else. What's the other thing that is uh, that controls it? Hormones. Hormones. And uh, you said smallest cells. Mm -hmm. I heard you say excellent. Excellent. I can think of really one more main one, but probably two more things. It's uh, unicelliated. Excellent. Uninucleated. Absolutely. So uninucleated is definitely a microscopic characteristic. It does have one nucleus. What's one thing that isn't necessarily microscopically relevant, but uh, one other thing that we know about smooth muscle? It has lines. the highest rate of regeneration. Oh, true. Okay. Excellent. That's two, actually. So yeah, highest rate of re regeneration. I was going to say aligns the uh, body cavities or whatever you call it. That was actually the one I was thinking about. Absolutely. So absolutely. So remember most, not moose, most uh, smooth muscle uh, uh, is found in the walls. Let's say it this way. Or lines the cavities. I like that too. Of hollow organs. Right. Most, not all. Like, for instance, the erector pili muscles and stuff like that uh, doesn't do that as well. But excellent. Spectacular. I think that is a really, really good list of characteristics to know about our smooth muscle. One other thing that you see nicely on this particular illustration here is that our smooth muscle is also typically arranged in layers. So one of these layers, notice, and I'll cheat and draw it this way. I'm just going to draw... Um, wait, I'll cheat and draw it that way. Uh, one, you can kind of see the spindle shape of it as it's a longitudinal view, as you see it in that kind of a longitudinal view. Uh, whereas notice uh, for this part right, and let's be more specific, this part right here, right? Basically the fibers are tasting forward towards you. So this would be a cross section. So you should be able to recognize this tissue both in a cross section and a longitudinal section when you look at this histologically. Yes, question. Um, yeah, so the layers, is that just mostly because for extra protection or? Oh, great question. No, in this case, for instance, like in the small intestine, uh, the reason not only that we have two different layers, but the layers are at different orientations has to do with the function. These muscle cells, the circular muscle cell, for instance, because it's a circular muscle, squeezes the lumen of the small intestine, whereas the longitudinal muscle shortens it. So what actually happens here in the, in the small intestine is we have these alternating contractions where it squeezes and then shortens and squeezes and shortens and squeezes and shortens. And as it does that, it moves the food through the small intestine. In fact, we have a fancy name for this rhythmic alternating contraction that takes place. Does anybody know the name of this alternating rhythmic contraction of these smooth muscle layers that move the food and move things from one point to another in a hollow organ? Come on, someone's got to know it. Hey, I know what you're talking about, but I forgot the word. Same. <laughs> as soon as it comes up, I'll know it, but I can't think of it right now. How about peristalsis? Yeah. 
Yeah, there you go. Excellent. So peristalsis. So that is, so that's the advantage of having those multiple layers like that is we can have those rhythmic contractions for that peristalsis for the movement of the stuff. And again, here, notice uh, they've taken a high uh, magnification illustration view of a cross section and a longitudinal section. In the longitudinal section of the layer, we see the lengths of the muscle cells. In a cross section, you're just seeing the, uh, the cut through them. Uh, so be able to recognize the plane of section for smooth muscle because it should be very, very obvious. And I think that's one of the things you're responsible for on your histology list. All right. So again, non-striated and involuntary found in the walls of our hollow organs. And this issue with it being non-striated is a big one. Because after all, what forms the stripes in our skeletal muscle cells? The myofilaments. Absolutely, yeah. so the myofilaments, the proteins and how they're precisely arranged. And as we learned, those precise arrangement of those proteins or would allow the muscle to efficiently contract. Well, if smooth muscle doesn't have stripes, that means it doesn't have myofibrils, means it doesn't have sarcomeres. And if it doesn't have sarcomeres, it must use a completely different method for contraction. And that is indeed the case. Now, I'll tell you from the start, as we mentioned, there are three specific types of skeletal muscle fast glycolytic, fast oxidative, and slow oxidative, there are two specific types of smooth muscle. There is the most common type, and that most common type is the one that, as we talked about, arranges in layers. And this most common type that arranges in the layers found in the wall of the hollow organs are what are called single unit or visceral smooth muscle. With the single unit or visceral, uh, it is lining the organs of our visceral organs. That's why it's called visceral. It is called single unit because what happens is the cells are connected by gap junctions. I'm just gonna cheat and draw some lines here instead of the spindles but we have these cells lined up in layers in walls. And uh, as we know, it needs to be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So that axon has to come in and we have to have a synaptic end bulb that's gonna release the chemical to affect some type of change. But unlike skeletal muscle, where every single muscle cell has to be communicated to by a neuron, Instead, what happens here is there are gap junctions between the muscle cells. So basically, as our action potential is produced in one cell, it can spread to all the other cells in our wall in that fashion. And so all the muscle cells work together as a single unit. And that is where it gets that name because they work together as a single unit and they're lining the organs of our, lining the walls of our visceral organs. So that's where it gets its name. However, as we talked about, the smooth muscle, for instance, in our erector pili muscles aren't forming a sheet. They're not lining a hollow organ. So clearly there's something different. And the smooth muscle like we find here or like we find in our eye that changes the focus of our eye or changes the amount of light that our eye can let in, that is what we call multi-unit smooth muscle. These are individual fibers uh, typically formed into a fascicle instead of a layer. And uh, each individual muscle needs its own synaptic input. So this single unit is at least organized more like skeletal with fascicles, with each muscle cell getting individually uh, innervated. But even though it's organized like skeletal muscle, remember, it's still not going to contract like it. Now, we've got the pretty words that show this, but your book has some pretty pictures that do the same thing. Here we see example of the layers. Uh, and again, just a few inputs because of the gap junctions that are going to allow all of these single unit visceral smooth muscle to work together as one. 
and why these aren't bundled together in the fascicle, but just kind of in a big pile. I guess they're just trying to show that it's not as organized into a layer, but we can see that each one needs its own input, which is why it's multi-unit. Each individual one needs its own synapse. So multiple synapses, each one can work independently or at least in their own uh, um, motor unit. All right. Now, there's a little bit more we need to understand about the anatomy to understand how our smooth muscle well, uh, smooth muscle cell works. So here is a nice illustration of this, but let's do a, a more simplistic drawing. So let's go to our whiteboard and clear this and go ahead and draw. And I'm gonna to totally cheat and nope, don't want it to be green though. Draw that as my spindle shaped smooth muscle cell. So yes, single unit smooth muscle and cardiac muscle have gap junctions, yes. But multi-unit smooth muscle does not. All right, we know there's a big centrally located nucleus. I'm not gonna bother drawing that because that is going to be in our way. One of the big differences between our smooth muscle and our skeletal muscle is that there are no transverse tubules. Someone remind me again what the transverse tubules were? Brings um, the stuff in, from the sarcolemma in. Sorry. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It's folds in the sarcolemma filled with the interstitial fluid that basically brings that action potential down deep into the muscle cell, primarily to depolarize the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Those big, huge mass uh, 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 storage facilities for calcium. Well, it turns out smooth muscle only has a small amount of sarcoplasmic reticulum. and no transverse tube, uh, no terminal cisternae. Notice that also means no triads because we don't have the enlarged terminal cisternae. We don't have a transverse tubule, right? And remember that transverse tubule and the terminal cisternae, the large sarcoblastic reticulum were about taking calcium that was stored in the cell already and releasing it into the cytosol. Well, it turns out smooth muscle has to rely on extracellular calcium. It needs to bring in much more calcium from outside of the cell for the muscle to contract. It is still gonna have regulatory proteins. We still need calcium to move those regulatory proteins, but primarily the calcium is gonna come from outside of the muscle cell. Now, that means we really need to rely on calcium that is nearby. So one of the things, while this doesn't have transverse tubules in vaginations that way in our plasma membrane, and I'll cheat a little bit and use, Oh, we can use this, this will work. There are tiny folds in the plasma membrane of our smooth muscle cell. These small little invaginations are what are known as the caviolae. And these caviolae are these little tiny nooks and cavities that store calcium outside of the cell. So when the calcium gets pumped out, it doesn't just leave, it goes into these little nooks and crannies. So it's close by to be readily brought in when the cell needs it. Now, as I mentioned, we still have regulatory proteins. Uh, that need to be moved, troponin and tropomyosin. We also still have uh, contractile proteins. We still have myosin and actin. 
However, they are arranged differently, right? There's no sarcomeres. And with no sarcomeres, there's no Z discs. But we still need an anchor for the actin. And it turns out that anchor comes in the form of a structure that is known as a dense body. Yes, Laura. Um, so just for clarification, so the smooth muscle does have myosin and actin, but they don't form those um, striations because of they don't have any sarcomeres? They're, they are not arranged in the same way uh, that they are in skeletal muscle. We do not have sarcomeres. We don't have Z discs. We don't have titan in the same way. So it's a different arrangement to them. Okay. But we still need anchor points. These anchor points come in the, in the form of structures that are known as dense bodies. And let's draw a handful of these here. These dense bodies connect to the plasma membrane. Uh, that's probably good. They connect to the plasma membrane. And in between them are intermediate filaments. Uh, let's use these as a different color. Let's go purple. Intermediate filaments, I'm sure you remember, are part of the cytoskeleton. So we have these proteins uh, that are embedded within the wall. I guess I have to draw a couple more to make it look pretty. That are embedded within the plasma membrane of the cell. Uh, they are interconnected by these dense bodies. And then between them is where we find the myosin and the actin. Myosin is still the thick filament located here in between the dense bodies, although there is something really interesting about this myosin, different from what we saw before. Remember in skeletal muscle, all of the myosin heads that are on the right point right, all of the myosin heads that are on the left point left when they are in their primed position. But in this case, with this myosin, oops, hold on. All of the myosin heads on one side, let me see if I can be easy to draw, all point in one direction. And all the myosin heads on the other side point in the opposite direction. So the red lines are the, are the prime myosin heads? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So the red, the smaller red lines are the prime myosin head. The bigger red line is that thick filament. There we go. Okay, that makes sense. Now, of course, the myosin needs something to pull on. And that thing it's gonna pull on is going to be the actin. But in this case, uh, the actin is going to be connected to those dense bodies. So again, this should line up parallel, but again, my drawing skills are not that great. So this one's coming this way. This one's going this way, something along those lines. So that notice when our myosin heads here pull, they are pulling this actin this way. So this, dense body is pulled towards the center. 
However, notice this dense body is connected by an intermediate filament to this one. So this dense body is going to get pulled this way, and this dense body is going to get pulled this way. And as this gets pulled, that pulls on this one as well. And notice the same thing's happening on this side. When the actin is pulled, this dense body is getting pulled this way, which pulls on these intermediate filaments, which pulls on these dense bodies. And what happens, notice, is that as this muscle contracts, our muscle cell shortens, but it's also going to twist and bulge as this occurs. Again, my drawing skills for this aren't the best, but let's take a look at the picture from your textbook. Notice again, we have our thick and thin filaments, but no sarcomeres, no transverse tubules, very little sarcoplasmic reticulum. We have our dense bodies that act like the Z discs where our actin is going to connect to, intermediate filaments connect the dense bodies together. Notice we have the caviolet, those little pockets for calcium on the outside of the plasma membrane. And here you can see what that single spindle shaped muscle cell looks like when it contracts. Not only does it get shorter like we expect, but notice it twists and it bulges while it does this. Now, does this look like a particularly fast and efficient way of contracting a muscle? No. No, this is not a very fast and not a very efficient way of doing this. These muscle contractions are typically much, much uh, weaker and can be as much as 30 times slower than the contraction of a skeletal muscle. But again, let's go back to the illustration. Notice if just one, let's do it this way. If just this one myosin is active and pulling on the dense body, it can cause all of this twisting and turning and bulging to occur. So notice it's not going to require quite as much force to be able to, or energy to be able to maintain this contraction. So while this is a much slower, much less efficient way of contracting, these contractions can be maintained for a much longer period of time with much, much less fatigue. Uh, yes, Laura, you had a question. Um, yeah, are the myosin and the actin more towards the center of this? So like or is, is I only so great question. I only drew one example of that on the illustration, but there is myosin and actin between all of this. So there's another myosin here and another myosin here and another myosin here and another myosin here. Notice they're not perfectly arranged. That's why we're not seeing the stripes. But we do have myosin and actin between all of these dense bodies. So it isn't just this one in the center that's being pulled on, all of them are being pulled on. So again, it causes this twisting, compacting and shortening of the smooth muscle cell when it does this. So again, uh, much slower, much weaker contraction, but it is much more uh, fatigue resistant. So it can be sustained for a much longer period of time. And it's almost impossible to fatigue these muscles, right? No matter how many cheeseburgers you have for breakfast, it's not like your stomach needs a timeout halfway through to continue to work on. Uh, yes, Yulia, are you asking the question you wrote? Because I just saw that that was there. Do you have a different one? I, yes, and and one more. So um, is, it, is this the binding site for thick filaments only or thin or both? The little Again. dots. The, the actin, so the thin filament actin is what connects to the dense bodies. Okay, and then the thick is in between. The myosin is in between, yes. Okay, yeah, and I did type out a question. Um, I'm just okay. unsure. The single unit smooth muscle cells are the, are the most common ones, and those are the ones that we find in the walls of our hollow organs. Okay. So inside the walls of our blood vessels, inside the walls of our digestive system, inside the walls of our airways, inside the walls of our uh, urinary system, any, uh, pretty much any hollow organ inside of your body, uh, really with the exception of the heart, has smooth muscle lining the walls of it. Okay. I, yeah. What about, so you said some of them are connected by gap junctions, some are not. 
how do we know is it based on location which ones are and so are not connected? all of the single unit have gap junctions that will connect them together it is the multi-unit ones like we find in the erector pili muscles like we find in the eyes that don't have uh, that don't do peristalsis that don't have gap junctions where each cell needs its own uh, connection to it all right ariana you had a question as well yeah, I'm just trying to understand it. So the so this is basically a drawing of like the small the, the smooth uh, muscle fiber that contains inside the dense bodies. Yep. Connected. Yeah, so notice basically if you look between the two pictures, this picture kind of shows what the muscle cell looks like on the outside. Mm -hmm. We're seeing its plasma membrane. We can see its nucleus poking through. We can see the dense bodies and the intermediate filaments that are connected to the plasma membrane of the cell. But what we're not seeing on this picture from the textbook are the proteins inside. We know that there's myosin and actin in between these dense bodies in these regions. Right, and so it is when the myosin and the actin that is in these spaces between the dense bodies, when they contract, that is what basically contorts and changes the shape. So notice what's happening here is that, right, these two are getting closer and these two are getting closer and these two are getting closer and these two are getting closer, but it's also pulling as, as this one moves towards the middle, it's also pulling on this one as well. Right, and so that's why you get this kind of complex, uh, you know, bulging and twisting of this cell. It's not quite as linear as we see in skeletal muscle. In skeletal muscle, everything's linear, it makes it very fast and also very efficient. So it's very powerful. This is a much slower, more complex process, but it also in many ways is more efficient in that it is much less likely to fatigue because even a small amount of ATP is gonna be able to maintain it in this twisting shape. Okay, okay, it makes sense now, thank you. Yes, they're between, yeah, the dense bodies are the anchor points that the, that the actin connects to. They're not in the dense bodies, they're connected to the dense bodies, absolutely between them, that is correct. All right. Excellent, and like we said, peristalsis is that uh, rhythmic contraction of the layers of our hollow organs to move things through it. And pretty much almost all of our organ systems that are hollow, digestion, respiratory, urinary, all of them uh, have an ability to, to do some type of peristalsis. Lymphatic, really it's the, the cardiovascular system is the only one that really doesn't use peristalsis. And why doesn't it use peristalsis? Can you repeat the question again? I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. No. Uh, why doesn't the cardiovascular system use peristalsis in the in the blood vessels? Because it's only in the heart. Well, no. Smooth muscle. Remember, in the blood vessels of our uh, cardiovascular system, there is smooth muscle. But we don't move the blood by having the blood vessels squeeze and do peristalsis and move the blood through it that way. Why not? What moves the blood instead? The pumping of the heart? Okay, exactly. Yeah. It, it doesn't need it because it has a heart. Exactly, the, the heart. The heart pumps. The heart pumps it, and so the blood vessels can change their diameter, but the blood vessels don't do peristalsis. All right. Again, that is an introduction to smooth muscle. Not everything you needed to know about, uh, everything you need to know for this test, but we'll talk about it more when we get to 431. Let's do the same thing quickly with cardiovascular uh, system, or more specifically, cardiac muscle. All right, what do we know about cardiac muscle? It's branched. Branched shape, excellent. What else? Striated. Say again? It's striated. Striated. And again, now we know what that means. What's the implication of that? It has stripes. What causes the stripes? The formation. The myosin and actin overlapping. Yeah, the precise arrangement. So it is striated because it has myofibrils. Right, it has sarcomeres. And if we have a sarcomere, we can understand how it's gonna contract. It is gonna contract in a very, very similar, not identical, 
but very similar fashion to what we see in skeletal muscle. Excellent. What else do we know about cardiac muscle? It has no regeneration. No regeneration. What else? Um, no, or has um, gap junctions and dendrites. Excellent. So there are a special um, cellular connections, right, called intercalated discs. And you are correct. In those intercalated discs, we have a large amount of gap junctions and desmosomes. Excellent. What else do we know about cardiac muscle? It's uninucleated. It's uninucleated. Yeah, we can put in parentheses mostly uninucleated. As we mentioned, there are some that have two muscle cells, but not many. So mostly uninucleated. What else? It's involuntary. Involuntary. In fact, it is able of producing its own action potentials. So remember, we said it's autorhythmic. Able to produce its own action potentials. What else? You guys are missing the obvious one. It can be modified by the... Um, Absolutely. Like... You're right. Because it is autorhythmic, it produces its own action potentials, but it can be modified by the autonomic nervous system and hormones. Excellent. But that even wasn't, that still isn't the easy one that I thought. What's the easy one? What do you say? Um, only there you go. Only found in the heart. Excellent. And I think that covers all of it that we've talked about up to this point. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at our cardiac muscle cell. Notice again, we see a lot of similarities to what we expect from skeletal muscle. We have myofibrils with Z discs, with myomycin, H zones, Z discs, A bands, I bands. All right? Notice the single nucleus in the center, not pushed to the side like we expected. But notice it's not identical. While we do have transverse tubules, notice that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is much more scant and there are no uh, terminal cisternae. So this tells us that it, obviously it does have some calcium inside of it, but it is going to need external uh, calcium. Uh, and uh, it, uh, to do that. So we'll rely much more on external calcium to move those regulatory proteins. It's not all just locked up inside of it. Produces a much less extensive sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, it is going to be similar to a muscle contraction, but not identical. The muscle action potential of it is very, very different. So let's talk about that. Okay, let's go to our whiteboard. Let's draw some things we know. So one thing that we've talked about in this class is a skeletal muscle action potential. And again, anytime we draw a graph, we wanna have time. We wanna have, we wanna label the axes. So over here is voltage, excellent. And what do we know about a skeletal muscle action potential? Uh, it relies on a voltage. Sure, relies on a voltage. Threshold. Yep, we reach some threshold. When we reach that threshold, what happens? It produces a muscle action potential. Yep, and what do we know about the muscle action potential? There's a latent period. 
Uh, true. Well, there's a latent period before we can produce the second one. That's absolutely true. So it has, so let's go ahead and put that in there. I like there. Has uh, a latent period. What do we call that latency period? That period where it can't produce another action potential. It wasn't latency. What was it that we called it? Was Most it just late. resting? No, remember it has a refractory period. Citation contractile company? Nope. Well, well, nope. You guys are getting too far into this. You guys are overthinking this. All right. You're right. It has a refractory period uh, where it can before it can produce another action potential. But tell me what you know about an action potential. All action potentials. What do you know about them? There's one, one action potential causes one. Uh, one twitch. Yeah. Absolutely. That is definitely one thing that we know. So we're going to need that skeletal muscle. Twitch, because you guys are absolutely correct. One muscle action potential gives us, oh, that's not a one, uh, gives us one twitch. Excellent. That is absolutely positively something we need to know about. But what else do you know about an action potential? So, okay, oh, let's start they're able to overlap. True, they have the potential to be able to overlap because of the refractory period. But again, we don't care about multiples right now. We care about one. All right, let's start easy. If we leave the cell alone, the cell is going to stay at some membrane potential. And what is that membrane potential likely to be? The negative 60 megavolts? Negative 70 millivolts, right? It's going to be resting. Then, like you guys said, we have to get it up to threshold, which is about negative 60. And if we reach threshold, we get an action potential. For an action potential, does the membrane potential stay at negative 70 millivolts? No. No. What does it do? Depolarizes. It depolarizes a little bit. A lot. A lot, exactly. A muscle action potential is a big positive signal. So we get a big, huge, rapid depolarization. Now, we haven't really talked about this explicitly, but we've mentioned it a couple times. Does this action potential last for a very long period of time? No. No, it's a very brief wave. So we get a huge rapid depolarization that instantly becomes a huge rapid repolarization. And the entire uh, skeletal muscle action potential only lasts about one to three milliseconds. It is an incredibly fast process. Now, you guys are right. We have the ability not to add action potentials together, but to add twitches together because there's a refractory period. And remember that refractory period is about one to five milliseconds. So five milliseconds, one to five milliseconds after we produce one action potential, we can produce a second. Excellent. Took a little uh, work, but we got there. And as you guys mentioned, that one muscle action potential will give us one twitch. So again, time here. In this case, it is tension here. And if, for instance, we were to stimulate the muscle cell right here. This is where we generated our muscle action potential. We get a twitch. And how many phases in a twitch? Three. Three. What's the first phase? Latent period. Latent period. And how does the tension change during the latent period? None. It doesn't. It doesn't. It stays the same. Then what do we have? A contraction. And how does the tension change during the contraction period? Increases. Increases. And then what happens? Resting period. Not oh. resting period. It's another R word. Relaxation period. Relaxation period. And how does the tension change during the relaxation period? Decreases. Decreases. Excellent. All right. Until it's back to rest, right? When is it back at zero, it's at rest. So this is that one twitch. And anybody remember how long a twitch what lasts? Five 
Is it the same thing as uh, action potential? No, nope. action potential is just that briefest electrical signal. Right, remember this lasted somewhere between tw uh, 40 and about 100 milliseconds. All right. Again, this is not new information. This is information we had already gone over. I know we've covered over a lot of information, but there really isn't any new information here. This is just a review of things we've already talked about. But the advantage of this is we can now compare these two exact same processes uh, in our cardiac muscle. In our cardiac muscle action potential, Again, we are going to look at voltage uh, over time. And again, we are gonna start with a cell that is sitting happily at about negative 70 millivolts. Again, when this cell gets excited, we are going to have a rapid depolarization, just like we did in our skeletal muscle cell. However, where our cardiac muscle is different is it is going to have a prolonged depolarization. This cell stays depolarized much longer. And the reason it does that is an influx of calcium. Remember, we told you we were gonna need a lot more calcium from this cell. And so we are gonna need a lot, uh, get that calcium in and that calcium coming in causes the cell to stay depolarized for a prolonged period of time. It's a period of time we call the plateau phase. Uh, plateau, oops, plateau phase. That doesn't look right either. Either, there, no. Why doesn't either of these look right? How do you spell plateau? How do you spell plateau? I think it's E-A-U. E -A E-A-U. E I had the right letters, I just didn't have it the same way. All right, excellent. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So this plateau phase where it's gonna stay uh, depolarized for a much, much longer period of time, and then eventually depolarizes back to rest. So we have a much longer action potential. The advantage of a much longer action potential is we're gonna get a much longer twitch. So when we look at and draw our twitch, tension, time, We generate our muscle action potential. And as a result of that, we again, get a single twitch. It's gonna work the same way. One muscle action potential equals one twitch. That part is the same for our, I guess I have to label this, cardiac. So, which so when we generate that muscle action potential, we're going to get those same three phases. We're going to get a latent period. We're going to get a contractile phase, and we're going to get a relaxation phase. However. The big difference here is that a single twitch of our cardiac muscle cell can last over 200 milliseconds. Now, 
the first important question I have for you is why? Why have such a dramatically different, dramatically longer contraction for our cardiac muscle than for our skeletal muscle? Is it because the heart has to pump blood throughout the whole body and it takes longer? You, well, it's not so much that it takes longer, but you absolutely have the right idea. The heart is a pump. How many of you used a pump before? Like for instance, a pump to fill up an air mattress. And I don't mean the way you fill air mattresses in now where you plug it into a wall and you push a button, it does it on its own. And bike tires are wimpy, those are for girls. I'm talking about, I'm talking about a big, huge air mattress, right? If you're gonna fill up a big, huge air mattress, right, with a hand pump, you're right, I apologize. I, I, if you're gonna fill that up with a hand pump, how easy is that to do? Not too easy. Not too easy, absolutely. But if you had to use your hand pump to do that, would you do it with a whole bunch of really, really fast pumps of that? Or would it be better to take full, long, complete contractions of that to be able to fill it up? Fuller so you don't oh, get long one. Exactly. The longer contraction, <laughs> exactly. Or, or those hand carts that they used to use, right? To go along train tracks. Absolutely. You've got the right idea though. A longer sustained contraction is going to give a much more efficient pumping action. And so when we want that pumping action, we want a longer sustained contraction for a much more efficient pumping of the, of the blood. Now, one last point that I want to emphasize on this. Remember, one of the things that you talked to guys talked about before is that over here with our skeletal muscle twitch, the refractory period is only about five milliseconds. So as you guys talked about, we can actually produce a second muscle action potential, add a second twitch on top of it, and then a third and a fourth and a fifth. And what did we call that process of adding twitches together? Trepe? Well, no, uh, trepe is when each one by itself gets larger after it goes back to rest because mm -hmm. of that. What did we call it when we added the waves together? Unfused tetanus or fused? No, we, unfused. We, well, you're right. We can we get can to a fused or unfused tetanus, but what was the process that we used to add waves together to get to that unfused tetanus? Wave stimulation. Wave stimulation. There you go. The fast refractory period allows for wave summation. So you're absolutely right to get the muscle to tetanize, right? We get it to tetanize, we can produce that long, powerful, sustained contraction, right? Do we want our cardiac muscle to tetanize, lock up into a sustained contraction? No. Yeah. No. So it turns out the refractory period for our cardiac muscle is actually more than 250 milliseconds. Notice that is longer than the twitch. So it is impossible to tetanize cardiac muscle, which is a good thing. We don't want it locked up in a sustained contraction. All right. Is it possible to do tetanize and would that like lead to a heart attack? No, uh, when we have, uh, uh, so disruptions of the neural flow are typically what cause uh, a heart attack or, or, some or damage to it, what causes a disruption of the flow. We don't get the normal flow of the signal from one to another. And like I said, we'll talk about this in much more depth when we get to 431. But uh, no, it is not possible to tetanize cardiac muscle. That doesn't mean that you can't have problems with the way electrical signal flows or problems with the way the heart pumps, but it can't tetanize. 
All right. Excellent. So again, quick question. Yes. So is the reason why I'm, I'm still not fully sure I understand why the cardiac muscle has such a long twitch. So is the reason why it does because we don't want it to stop pumping? So it just okay. has a long one. So uh, I understand what you're asking, but I think there's two minor things that you're confusing with this. There is the why it occurs and why it is important. And I think that's the thing that you're confusing. Why it occurs uh, for us in this class, we'll get a little bit more complicated and explain it in a little bit more depth in 431. But the short version of why we get the longer muscle action potential is because, uh, again, at the beginning of both of these, when we have this big, massive depolarization, that big, massive depolarization is caused by sodium entering into the cell, OK? So in both cases, we have sodium entering the cell. We get this big, huge, rapid, massive depolarization. But what happens in cardiac muscle that doesn't happen in skeletal muscle is that uh, the next thing that happens is some calcium channels open. And we have a large amount of very positive calcium entering into the cell. And because we have a lot of calcium entering in the cell, And since calcium is positive, the cell D stays depolarized. So that is why it has that prolonged depolarization is because of the influx of calcium. Now, you are right. The reason that is important is because a long action potential gives us a long twitch. And that long twitch gives us a longer sustained, more efficient contraction, pumping action. All right. So does this happen in, I assume the answer is yes, but does this happen in both the ventricles and the atria? Yep. Because it's all cardiac, right? Okay. All cardiac muscle, absolutely. And like I said, I, 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 sorry that you're feeling overwhelmed by this, but I will warn you when we get to 431, we're going to talk about this in even much more depth. So we're going to get even more in depth in it. And maybe more in depth helps more. So if you are overwhelmed, I would encourage you to go to the textbook and read where they talk about it. But let's move away from the pictures and go back to the pretty words and talk about some of these differences. Remember, like we talked about, uh, the big differences, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. Differences in uh, skeletal and cardiac action potentials. is that cardiac muscle action potential lasts much, much longer, 10 to 15 times longer than skeletal. I don't know why my C is not working. There we go. Um, and again, it's because of that influx of calcium. That gives us a much longer contraction. Remember, even the slowest skeletal muscle contracts at a rate of about 100 milliseconds whereas the contraction for our heart muscle is well over 200 milliseconds. Also with skeletal muscle, because that refractory period is only one to five milliseconds, we can add twitches together with that wave summation to tetanize the muscle. But the refractory period for cardiac muscle is actually longer than the contraction. So it is impossible to add twitches together in cardiac muscle. And if you can't add twitches together, you can't tetanize the muscle, which is an okay thing. We don't want the heart muscle locking up into a sustained contraction where it doesn't stop. And lastly, as we talked about, there are gap junctions that connect the muscle cells together. 
So every single cardiac muscle cell doesn't need input from the nervous system. They're able to spread the electrical signal from one cell to the other. And again, that allows them to work together as one. All right, excellent. Questions on that? All righty. Well, either there's no questions because you understand it or there's no questions because uh, you guys are, are stunned and overwhelmed like Yulia. And again, we'll talk more about it in 431, but remember we also need to learn, and again, we'll wait till 431 for that, uh, that know that some of these cardiac muscle cells are actually able to stimulate themselves and those are autorhythmic. And we'll talk about those. We're not gonna worry about this for this class. Uh, your book does talk about it, but I'm not going to hold you for that in this class. We will do that, like I said, in 431. And in fact, if you take me for 431, cardiovascular system is the very first system we will uh, be uh, tackling. Excellent. Well, so yes. So uh, so if you're taking me for 431 in the fall, then by all means, after this class, take a good two, three days off. And then I want you diving straight into the cardiovascular system. All right. Excellent. So here we have the pretty picture. Again, obviously the vast majority of what we've covered and therefore the vast majority of the test is going to be on skeletal muscle. That's where we spent most of our time. But we've at least now had an introduction to cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. And so uh, we have some basic understanding of them, certainly more so of their anatomy and microscopy, but also a little bit of their function now as well. All righty, that is everything we need to know then for a uh, for the lecture exams, but we still have a lot to do in our lab exams. So let's go ahead and switch gears. So that can go there. Oops, what just happened? There we go. Bring this up. All righty. So again, we need red pens, red and blue pens. Uh, we need our handouts and we need to uh, restart at, we'll call it 2.17. That'll give us a 15 minute break. And this time I will pause the recording. And so I will make sure to start the recording when we return, all right? All righty, any questions before we switch gears? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty, excellent. Our last little bit of business we have to deal with is to finish off talking about our uh, muscles the origins, insertions, and actions. We just finished last time talking about our hamstring, which was a muscle group. And someone remind me again of the rules for a muscle group. Have the same origin or insertion. Excellent, they must have a share. So obviously two or more muscles, right? Because otherwise it's not a group, there you go. But absolutely, one of the important things is they must share at least one attachment point. Excellent. And of course, to finish it off, they must be similar in uh, their uh, actions, not identical, but similar. For the hamstring, what was the attachment that all three of these muscles shared? And you should have the list in front of you. It should be something you guys be able to figure out. The ischial tuberosity. Yeah, exactly. The origin, right? The long head of the bicep femoris, the semimembranosus, and the semitendinosus all originated from the same location. And that didn't show up well, so we'll just do that, right? 
its origin is what they shared. I make a point of emphasizing this because when we get to our next big muscle group, well, I guess I should have left that there. Our next big muscle group, which is the quadricep femoris, the attachment point that they are all going to share is their insertion. So the good news is, as the name indicates, quadriceps femoris, four different muscles coming together, uh, uh, sharing one attachment point, and they're going to be similar in their actions. And what is the, and so let's actually switch to the uh, whiteboard, or not the whiteboard, but my drawings to do this one. What is the insertion that all of these four muscles share? The quadriceps tendon to the patella, then patellar ligament to tibial tuberosity. Okay, so when we talk about insertion, we talk about the attachment point, where it actually attaches. You are absolutely correct in that it is the tib oops, tibial tuberosity. That is the insertion for all of them, right? And so again, we can take our pencil or a pen. We know it is that bump that is on the front. And so if on the exam, I ask you for the insertion for any of these four muscles, you just have to say tibial tuberosity. But as you noticed, you said a lot more than tibial tuberosity. And the reason for that is what you provided for me is the entire insertion pathway. The good news is this is the only insertion pathway you need to know for this exam. So technically, if you see the question on the lab exam and it says identify the insertion pathway of the muscle, Heck, you don't even have to look to see what the muscle is because there's only one insertion pathway that you need to know. And can you describe for me again what that insertion pathway was? The quadriceps tendon to the patella and then the patellar ligament to the tibial tuberosity. Excellent, quadriceps tendon into the patella and then the patellar uh, ligament into the tibial tuberosity. All four of these muscles come together. Notice it's a term we've used for some of the other muscles we've talked about. They have a shared tendon. That shared tendon, which of course connects muscle to bone, is known as the patella tendon or the quadricep tendon. I will accept both of those. And they attach these four muscles to a bone. And that bone happens to be the patella. Of course, there is an extension of that dense regular connective tissue that goes from the patella to the tibial tuberosity. Of course, this connects bone to bone, which is why it is known as the patellar ligament. So now the first one is a tendon because it's going muscle to bone. This one is going bone to bone, so it is a ligament. So it is a little bit long, this insertion pathway, but the good news is it's the only insertion pathway you need to know, and you get to use it for four different muscles. So if I ask you for the insertion pathway of the rectus femoris, or any of the vastus brothers, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, and vastus medialis, the answer to that is gonna be the same. The answer for the insertions of those are the same. The answers for the insertion pathway for those are the same. All right. Questions on that. All right, excellent. Now that we've got the insertions and insertion pathways. Let's talk about the individual muscles. Now I'm gonna lose this when I switch slides, but I'm okay with that. 
the quadricep is typically considered to be an anterior muscle group. In fact, it's the largest anterior muscle group. Although, and again, this is easier to do when we have the model sitting in front of us in the classroom. What you'll actually see is while this is considered an anterior muscle group, and certainly its insertion pathway, that tendon going into the patella, going into the tibial tuberosity, is on the front of the leg and so influences the leg that way. When you get a chance to look closely at these models, what you'll see is, again, there are four muscles, rectus femoris. Remember, we have a rectus abdominis, and that is a long, straight muscle. And here we have a long, straight muscle as well. Deep to it underneath, uh, and we see a little portion of it down here, is our vastus intermedius, the one in between. And notice they, as we would expect, both line up smack dab on the anterior, smack dab on the middle of the leg. But there are two more vastus muscles, a vastus lateralis, which as the name indicates, really is on the lateral side of the bone. And the vastus medialis, which as its name indicates, is really on the medial side of the bone. So when we look at the origins for both the vastus lateralis and vastus medialis, we will see that their origins come both from the back of the bone and the front of the bone, and they wrap around. Medial comes around the medial side, lateral comes around the lateral side. So let's take a look at these origins for these four muscles and uh, see if that helps us to understand where they are and what they do. All right, what is the, let's start easy. What is the origin of the rectus femoris? The anterior inferior of the spine. Excellent. So it's a little big, I'm gonna go a little smaller. It is the, say it again, which one? Anterior. Anterior inferior iliac spine. Excellent. So remember our iliac crest has two bumps on it an anterior superior and an anterior inferior iliac spine. So that is where it originates. And of course, even though I just said it like 15 times, where does it insert? Tibial tuberosity. Tibial tuberosity, absolutely. Notice I just asked for the insertion, not the insertion pathway. So there is our insertion right there. And of course, if I'd asked for the insertion pathway, I would want right, quadricep tendon to the patella, patella ligament to the tibial tuberosity. So this muscle, and I'll go ahead and draw it in green, is a long straight muscle that basically comes straight down the leg like this. Now, there's two important things to know about our rectus femoris. First, how many joints does it cross? Two. Two, excellent. So it is an anterior muscle that crosses the hip. So what is its action on the hip going to be? Flexion. Well, it's anterior, so it's on the front. So what does it do on the front? Anterior muscles typically do what? Oh, flex. flex, so it flexes, it brings it forward. However, it does cross that wonky knee. So what kind of an action does an anterior muscle have on the knee? It extends. It extends. So there are two actions to the rectus femoris, right? It flexes the uh, leg and it extends the knee. When would you use something like this? Running. A soccer ball. Yeah, kicking a soccer ball, absolutely, right? If you're going to kick that soccer ball, uh, especially if you're trying to score, right? You want to hit it with your toe or kicking that field goal. You want to kick it with your toe and that big, huge swing of the leg. The second thing we need to know about the rectus femoris is this rectus femoris is a bipennate muscle. If you remember, toe poke rip, I don't, 
know what that means. Topo is just the name of a type of kick where you just use your uh, toe instead of the side of your foot. Oh, yeah, exactly. And that's the key. You're using the your toe to, yeah, to absolutely rip it. Absolutely. So perfect. We know it's two actions. The other thing, long straight muscle, but the other important thing about the rectus femoris is it is a bipennate muscle. Remember what that means. It means it has a singularly located tendon and then it has all these parallel fascicles that run along the side. I'm not gonna go the whole length, but you get the idea. There are these parallel fascicles. It makes it a big, remember the advantage of having lots of fascicles is lots of strength. Your leg is a big, huge chunk of mass. And to be able to move, it requires a tremendous amount of power. And this is one of the strongest muscles of the body right? Because it needs to be able to kick that leg out in that big, huge, uh, massive fashion. All right. Excellent. So there is that. Now, while we have this one drawn here, let's talk about the vastus intermedius. Obviously, the insertion for the vastus intermedius is the same. This is, after all, the insertion for all of them and the insertion pathways for all of them. Uh, so we'll use pink for the vastus intermedius. What is the origin? Oops, back into black. What is the origin of the vastus intermedius? Anterolateral surface of the femur. All right. So basically, it's right here. Anterior lateral surface of the femur. So this is the origin of the vastus. Intermedius. And again, notice if we use, I'll use brown this time to draw its shape. Oh, hold on, I want that to stay pink, but I will draw the muscle as brown. It literally sits right underneath the rectus femoris. Are there enough leg presses and squats or exercises that we could do where you're ever gonna be able to see the vastus intermedius on your leg? No. No, because no matter how much you work it out, that vastus, um, pardon me, that rectus femoris is going to be on top. In fact, if we go back to the pretty picture from your textbook, you can see the only way we're able to see it on a model or here on this illustration is by cutting it. When they cut that rectus femoris, then we can see it here. Now, notice we have these nice, uh, let's go to... See how clever I was on the leg models I gave you guys. Someone's washing their dishes. Well, being clean is important. All right. Excellent. Notice here we get a really nice view of this rectus femoris muscle. And again, here we get that appreciation of how it has a single tendon. No, it's not showing up at all. Let's try green. And a single tendon down the center and then all the fascicles on both sides going off to the side. A nice big bipennate massively strong muscle in a short compartment. Uh, yes, Ariana. This is off topic, but for like the four pages that we're learning about the muscles and the anatomy, this is all going to be on the exam, right? Yeah, that primarily the lab exam. However, again, remember all the information is for all the class. So while I could point at a model like this on the exam, a picture like this could easily be on the exam. I could point at a muscle like this and I could basically ask you four questions, right? Identify the muscle, identify the origin of the muscle, identify the insertion of the muscle, identify the uh, you know, uh, insertion pathway. So actually there's five questions for this one, insertion pathway, insertion, origin, and two actions, 
as well as the name. So there's those that I could ask for this. But if you think about it, I also on the lecture exam, for instance, like on a multiple choice question or something like that, could I ask, identify which of the following muscles would allow you to kick a soccer ball with the toe of your foot or something like that, All right? And so I could ask that that way. So yes, you are responsible. This, this information is, is primarily gonna be is all the stuff that you're gonna need for the lab exam, but also it can be on the lecture exam as well. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then I don't know if I have one with that removed. Nope, not really. That's all right, this will help for later. Okay, so that's good. So we can at least see it here and we know that if we remove this on the model, we'd see the vastus intermedius in between. What I do want to show you for this, that this picture shows nicely is notice here we're looking at the medial aspect of the leg. And here on the medial aspect of the leg, we can see the vastus medialis and see that the vastus medialis really is, while it's considered part of an anterior muscle group, really is on the medial part of the leg. And we see that when we look at its origin. What is the origin of the vastus medialis? The linea aspera and the intracancentric line. Inter uh, intertrochanteric. Line. Trochanteric, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Again, and I don't care how you say the things as long as you spell them correctly, but you absolutely have the right idea. Remember, on the anterior side of the femur, basically between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter is that raised ridge. And now we know why it's a raised ridge because a muscle attaches to it and pulls on it. But the first thing you said was the linea aspera. And I'll draw this as a dotted line to remind us that this is a posterior thing. Remember there's that line on the back of the femur, that raised ridge that is that linea aspera. So what actually happens with, and I'll use brown again for this, uh, what we actually see is yes, some of the muscle fibers start up here in the front, but a lot of them start in the back and wrap around. So we have these muscle fibers that are starting in the back and wrapping around the leg, ultimately coming into that tendon, which as we know, that tendon comes into the patella and the patella ligament goes into the tibial tuberosity. So we have these muscles. And when we actually look at the model again, uh, you'll see how the fascicles wrap around the leg from the back to the front. Now, as it turns out, we have similar origins to the vastus lateralis. For the vastus lateralis, notice it also starts on the back on that linea aspera. It also starts at the intertrochanteric line, but the vastus lateralis being a lateral muscle also originates from the lateralist most point of the hip. And as we all know, what is the lateralist most point of the hip? The greater trochanter. The greater trochanter, right? That was one of the questions from your 30 point bone feature exam that quite frankly, most of you got wrong. But, cause again, here is the hip and here is the top. Notice the ilium, the iliac crest, the superior anterior iliac spines are not a part of the hip. This is the hip. That greater trochanter is the lateral most point of the hip. So notice, and I'll use uh, green this time. Our vastus lateralis, yes, starts at the top, but it also starts at the back. And again, it wraps around on the lateral aspect of the leg coming in. So while this is an anterior muscle group, these two muscles basically start in the back of the femur and wrap around and come into the front. Now, before we switch sides, um, how many joints does the, do these two muscles cross? Uh, just one. Just, just one. one. And notice if we go back to the vastus intermedius, which started on the femur and inserts into the um, 
tibial tuberosity, how many joints did it cross? Wait, were you asking the rectus femoris or vastus? No, femoris? vastus intermedius. Just one. Yeah. So notice all three vastus mother, the vastus uh, muscles, all just cross one joint, just cross the knee. So notice all three muscles have just one action. And what is the one action of all three of these muscles? Extend the knee. Extend, yeah, extend the knee. Exactly. Yep, no problem. Yeah, yeah the, you're right. The rectus femoris has two, and we talked about that. That was the kick in the soccer ball. But notice this one is just swinging your leg. When you're sitting, that little kid is sitting on the big rocking chair, and he swings his leg out, right? Just that extension of the knee, that is all we're doing. So this this three, or like if you're one of those river dancers, right? The river dancers, basically, the from the leg, the knee down is the only part of their bodies that move, right? That's what they're using for this. All right. So notice all three of these only cross one joint, the knee, on the anterior side. So all three of them have the exact same action. They extend the knee. All right, let's start first by coming back here. Notice here again, we see that vastus medialis on the medial side. Uh, ah, here, we see the vastus lateralis on the lateral side. Notice we can tell this is the lateral side because we see the iliotibial band. And notice, like I talked about, we can see the fascicles wrapping around and coming in. Notice if we switch down to the vastus medialis, we can see the fascicles coming down and in. And notice one more thing, which I think our illustration from the textbook shows nicely. Notice they have similar origins, but remember the vastus lateralis starts up here on that greater trochanter, right? So it starts up here. So if you notice the belly of the vastus lateralis is a little higher than the belly of the vastus medialis. In fact, the belly of the vastus medialis is right next to the kneecap. I make a point of emphasizing this because remember one of the things we need to be able to do is recognize these muscles on a bodybuilder. And notice that in this leg, there's some major transformation that's taking place here. And I want you to see and appreciate why. There's two things here in particular that I want you to notice. The first, notice if you look closely at this particular muscle right here. This particular muscle right here happens to have a tendinous insertion right down the center and is a bipennate muscle. Notice this small muscle, notice it only goes about halfway to the knee is the rectus femoris. On the model, it goes all the way to the knee, but notice it doesn't here. And that's because of its shape. Because of that bipennate shape, when this muscle gets bigger, we know muscles get bigger by growing more cells or adding more proteins to it, this muscle gets wider. But because of the tendon, it doesn't get longer. So notice as the bigger vastus muscles, like the vastus intermedius underneath get larger, they push it up. And as they push it up, it actually gets further away from the knee. So on this bodybuilder, because of the massive increase in size of the vastus intermedius, it actually pushes the, the rectus femoris up and it moves further away. Also looking at these legs can be very intimidating. But notice, no matter how big that leg gets, we can always find the kneecap. And remember what we just learned, the vastus medialis is always right next to the kneecap. No matter how big that leg gets, the vastus medialis is always right next to the kneecap. And if I can find that, I can find my rectus femoris. And if I can find that, I can find my vastus lateralis. And as we see, no matter how big these legs get, 
Am I able to see the vastus intermedius underneath it? No. No. So using those cues, using those guides, it should be pretty easy to tell these three muscles of the quadriceps femoris that we can see on our bodybuilder picture. You Can you real quickly point them out again? No. I'm confusing two muscles. Um, so find the kneecap. When you find the kneecap, then right here, you find the vastus medialis because the big belly of the vastus medialis is always going to be right next to the kneecap. So from the kneecap, we find the vastus medialis. Of course, this is medial. That makes this one over here lateral. This must be the vastus lateralis. And in between the two then, and notice it also gives us the dead giveaway by having the tendon there. Because no matter how big your muscles get, your size of your bone of your kneecap doesn't get any bigger. Right? You can't, there are no exercises to make your kneecap bigger. Right? The patella stays the same size. So yeah, compared to the rest of the leg, it does look tiny, absolutely. But with this tendinous insertion, we have our bi uh, pennate rectus femoris right here in between. So there you go. Got it? Thank you. You're welcome. All right, questions on the quadricep femoris muscles? Yeah. Yep. What's the difference between the root word of is and us? Like rectus femoris and vastus medi medius? I don't know, something Latin. Uh, singular and plural, maybe. I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, and yes, intermediate is the one that's going to be underneath that we don't see. I, I don't. I, I assume there's some Latin root to it, but I'm afraid I don't know. Okay, because sometimes the root words help me on some. I, and I and I appreciate bones. that. And when I know them, I try to pass them on. But this is one. This is that's a good one. I don't. I don't have an answer for you for that one. That one I don't have. All right. So it's a great question. It's an excellent question, uh, but when I don't. Oh, there you go, that could be that too. Yep, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know. I have this link I found, a couple of links where like they kind of like um, have like acronyms to help memorize all of them. I, like, I could put them in the, the chat if anybody wants sure. them. Excellent, that'd be awesome. I would appreciate that. Awesome, yeah, I'm all for things that help people be successful. All right. That is our, uh, our next muscle group that we're responsible for. And I think that's our last muscle group we're responsible for. So let's talk about some individual muscles. The first one I want to talk about is the most medial muscle of the leg. And the most medial muscle of the leg is the gracilis. We see how medial this superficial medial muscle is when we draw its origin and its insertion, right? The gracilis, let's start easy with its insertion. What is the insertion of the gracilis? The inferior remus of pubis. No, oh. the insertion. Insertion is just inferior to medial condyle of tibia. Yeah, remember this, this indentation under the medial condyle, remember we talked about that there are actually four muscles. I'll write the small. Uh, into this region, right? We learned two of them last week. They were the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. Semimembranosus, semitendinosus. Excellent, thank you for sharing that. Um, and now we're learning a third. That third is the uh, gracilis. So I will do this one in dark red. Oops, nope. I want that to stay black. 
Oh, well. Oh, I guess not. All right, fine. I'll do this in black. The gracilis. Excellent. So a very medial insertion and also a very medial origin. And I know you said it for me already, but can you say for it again? What's that medial origin for this muscle? Um, inferior ramus of pubis. Exactly, the inferior ramus of the pubis. Basically, it comes right up to the pubic symphysis, right? The pubic symphysis is right on the midline. It can't get much more medial than the midline of the body. And so what we have here is this thin strap-like muscle that starts medial and stays medial and connects from the basically inferior angle, the inferior ramus of the pubis to the medial condyle of the tibia. Now notice how many joints does this cross? Uh, two. Two, hip and the knee. So it's gonna affect both. And in fact, how many actions does this muscle have? It has one, one two, three four. three, four. Four. It has four actions. Let's start easy. Being a medial muscle, that means it's going to bring the leg medially. And what type of action would that be? Duct. AD right, duct. Exactly. AD duct. Bringing it in that way. Absolutely. It's this strap like muscle that basically runs along the inside of your leg. So basically what it does is, is it collapses the leg and brings it up. So when you collapse it and bring it up, it is going to flex both the hip and the knee. It's gonna bring it inward, flex both the hip and the knee, and it is going to medially rotate the leg as well. Did anybody come up with a good example of where you might use this gracilis? What about like riding horse? Excellent, I like that, riding a horse, absolutely, because you have to have your legs bent so you're kind of acting as a shock absorber. You wanna bring the knees in and rotate it inward. I think that's awesome. That's actually one of the better ones I've heard. That's spectacular, I like that a lot. I not heard that one before, not have thought of that one before. I like that one tremendously. I did have one that a student demonstrated for me several years ago. She referred to uh, the action of the gracilis as what she referred to as her uh, fangirl pose, right? So there she was uh, getting ready for a BTS concert. And as you can see, she has her hip flexed, her knee flexed. She is uh, AD ducting her knees, bringing them together and immediately rotating them in that fashion. So this was uh, what she demonstrated as her fangirl pose uh, using the gracilis uh, to be able to do that. All right. And again, I don't care how you say it as long as you spell it correctly on the exam. So be the sophisticated student and just give it to me right that way. All right, excellent. So again, it is, well, you know what, but again, it, it, Having a bong rip is a hilarious example. It's a silly example, but often silly examples are the things that help you to be able to recall it. I mean, that's one of the tricks of these things is having that silly thing. Oh, I like that pulling a lightsaber. You'll have to explain that one to us. Uh, but having those things are, are definitely the things that if it helps you to remember it, then it is absolutely serving its purpose. This, this is actually, I'm going to miss this tremendously. This is one of my favorite exams to proctor when we're in person because as everybody's going around the lab exam and they're at a station and they have to remember what a muscle does, you get to see everybody like kind of wiggle their bodies there. All right, what does that muscle do again? What are the actions of that? So I get to see everybody kind of dance around in their seats while I'm, uh, while I'm proctoring this lab exam. So I do miss this. This is, this is the exam I miss the most uh, when we're uh, from being in class uh, because of that. Uh, but, uh... <laughs> yeah. Uh, gosh, do we have time to get into that? Um, all right, quickly, I will get into this. As of right now, although this could be changing practically daily as these things are coming up, um, they are some, there is the potential for some labs to be on campus. They're not letting all of the lab classes come back 
uh, just some of the, just a few, a small amount uh, for those that can be handled. However, unfortunately, most classes are still going to be completely online for the fall as things are right now. That may change. And the same thing is true as well. If we're on campus and problems are occurring, uh, then you could get dumped back out of uh, campus back online again. So, um, my understanding is that my class is not going to be one of the ones that will be on campus. So I will not, I, my, it is my understanding. And again, this could change, uh, but I believe that I am fully online for the fall, but as of right now, but that could potentially change. The one thing I will say is that if there is any on campus labs, uh, then uh, there is, then the, the open lab that Jeff is doing online, he will be able to do in the classroom. So even if you are in a fully online a and class, you would be able to go onto campus on Fridays to use the materials, see the models, see the charts and do things that way. God, no, I don't teach that micro. I, I, one, of my, one of my dearest and closest friends, uh, Julie Oliver, uh, who is an absolutely amazing instructor at Cosumnes River College, um, uh, is an amazing instructor and uh, works great. Uh, and she teaches micro. And I've sat on her classes many times. And I'm fairly certain she's making up about two thirds of the things she talks about in micro. You know, things like prions, none of those things can really be real. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Uh, it's both. I mean, it, there, it, it, with there tends to be more attrition with the online. So fewer students are passing, but it still tends to be pretty. Uh, yeah, uh, Julie Oliver, she is amazing, but I'm I'm pretty sure she lies. She makes most of her stuff up. All right, we still got a lot of stuff to get through this, so let's continue to do this. Um, we did the gracilis. Now I want to talk about the sartorius. So let's go back here so we can see how the, these are similar. Again, we have our gracilis that goes uh, from medial to medial, from the uh, inferior ramus of the pubis to the medial condyle of that. And then when we talk of uh, the tibia, when we talk about the sartorius, uh, the sartorius is the um, longest muscle of the body. Now, it turns out to be the fourth muscle that inserts into the medial condyle. So the four muscles are the gracilis, the sartorius, the semimembranosus, and the semitendinosus. And while it inserts medially, the sartorius to be the longest muscle has to be as high up as it possibly can be and actually starts on the lateral side. So the sartorius actually originates from the superior anterior iliac spine. And basically it is this big long strap like muscle that starts laterally along the leg and then wraps around to come to the medial side. So it's kind of this big, huge S-shaped strap-like muscle that wraps around the leg. Now, we've done the origin and the insertion, so let's look at the picture. Here we see it on the illustration, starting at that superior anterior iliac spine and wrapping around the head uh, the vastus medialis and coming in on the medial side. And we see it on the model as well. Notice it was starting. So again, this shows this so well. I love this. Here is the gracilis starting medially and staying medially. Here is the sartorius starting laterally, wrapping around wraps around the head of the vastus medialis and comes into that medial condyle of the tibia. Again, it's not the strongest muscle, but it is the longest muscle. And let's go back here. Like the gracilis, it crosses two joints, the hip and the knee. Like the gracilis, it is going to bring the leg up 
So it flexes the hip and flexes the knee. But whereas the gracilis brings the leg medially because its origin is medial, the sartorius brings the leg laterally because it is a lateral muscle. So while the gracilis adducts and medially rotates, the sartorius abducts and laterally rotates. So those are the four actions of the sartorius. Flex the knee, flex the hip, right? Abduct and laterally rotate. All right. Questions on that? Apparently I'm old. I don't know who Jacob Sartorius is. All right. Questions on that one? All right, excellent. Now. I have a quick question. Yes. So um, muscles that originate laterally would bring would bring um, limbs laterally and muscles that originate medially would bring like your arms and legs in. Right, because remember when a muscle contracts, it brings the insertion towards the origin. Right, so it brings yes. the insertion towards the origin. Yes, okay, just double checking, thank you. All right, excellent, questions on that? All right, excellent. So as we talked about, the rectus femoris is one of the strongest muscles of the body, but it's not really the strongest. Oh, and I lied. We do have one more muscle group you are responsible for. There you go. I want to be famous for nothing. Does that mean he's like a Kardashian? All right, excellent. Let's talk about the last muscle group. The last muscle group is made up of three muscles, the iliacus, the psoas major, and the psoas minor. Uh, but again, you don't know if you need to know those individual names. We just need to know them collectively as the ilius psoas. This ilius psoas, you'll notice, you don't need to know the origins and the insertions of it, but it is important to know where it's located. Notice, as the names indicate, the iliacus is on the inner fossa of the ilium. And the psoas major attaches to the, and the psoas minor attached to the lumbar vertebrae. Again, as we talked about, this leg is a big, huge, fat chunk of mass that needs to be moved through space. And so if you think about it, this is a muscle that is actually anchored inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity. It is anchored to our big, strong lumbar vertebrae. It is anchored to our pelvis. It is anchored to the core of our body. So we're able to lift that leg up. And in fact, it just has one action. It attaches to the front of the femur and it flexes the hip. Notice this illustration of the model here does a nice job of showing it, but where I think we actually see it the best, oops, I passed it, didn't I? Where is it? Oh, I know where I've seen it. Okay, excellent, let's do this. Um, on the models, and not just any model, but our torso model. In the classroom is this big, life-size human torso. When we look at this, there is a big, huge breastplate, really chest plate, that comes along the entire abdominal, pelvic, and thoracic cavity and comes off. And notice as we look inside, so for instance, notice this happens to be a female, we see the uterus, we see the ovaries, the uterine tubes, the bladder, all of those things on the inside. Here, inside the abdominal pelvic cavity, lining the inner surface of the ilium, coming off of the lumbar vertebrae, and coming together to come out underneath the inguinal ligament, 
is that iliopsoas, that big, huge, strong muscle that is gonna allow you to flex your leg and bring it up into the air. All right. Uh, so we did that, we've done that already. Ah, one more muscle you don't need to know the origin and the insertion of, uh, but I want to talk about is the adductor magnus. The adductor magnus is part of a muscle group known as the adductors. There's an adductor longus and brevis and magnus, and we actually see them better if we go to the deeper view here, excellent. Notice here we see the longest has been cut. Here's the brevis, but we don't care about any of those. What we care about is the biggest, the adductor magnus. Notice on the models, it's gonna be easy to find because it is the muscle that is just deep to the uh, gracilis. So notice if we go back to our leg model and we look on the medial side, excellent, here's the medial side. Notice as we look at the medial side here, this indeed is the gracilis that we can see right there. And then deep to it, right here, and you can also see it right here behind it, this muscle that's deep to it is the adductor magnus. So find the gracilis and from the gracilis, you can find the adductor magnus. All right, now, why are we pointing out this muscle? Well, for a couple of reasons. With a name like adductor magnus, what do you think its primary action is going to be? Adduct. AD duct. Yeah, AD duct the leg, right? Bring it towards the midline. So if I'm standing and I kick my leg out to the side, do I really need to use my adductor, my adductor magnus to bring my leg back down? No. No. Pretty much gravity does it for me, right? The, the, you know, pretty much gravity does this muscle's job. So if I really want to tone and work out this adductor, is it possible? Yes. Yeah, they have those machines at the gym that look like torture machines that you can get into, you know, with your legs all spread out and you have to squeeze them together. But you can't make eye contact with anybody at the gym when you're doing that. So you don't spend too much time on there. So how <laughs> soon do people's adductor muscles usually get? It's extremely not very, not yeah, very tone. Yeah, it's not very tone, exactly. So all the time you hear about uh, athletes Soccer players, baseball players, football players getting a groin injury or a strained groin. Well, when they talk about that groin injury, probably about 75% of the time, it is a strain to the muscle of the adductor magnus. It is the most common muscle that is injured in what we commonly refer to as a groin injury. Notice also when we go back to that bodybuilder picture, Notice, again, let's draw the muscles that we can clearly see with our bodybuilder. Again, we have, well, let's start easy. Kneecap, that gives us our vastus, med oops, our vastus medialis. Uh, that helps us find our rectus femoris. That helps us find our vastus lateralis. And notice if you look closely, I'll change colors to really emphasize it. We can see this strap like muscle that wraps around the head of the vastus medialis and comes into the medial side of the leg. What muscle is that? Is that the sartorius? Yeah, notice we can clearly see that sartorius muscle, that nice strap like muscle on the leg. But as we look over here, on the medial aspect of the leg. As much time as this guy's putting into the gym here, can we distinguish the gracilis? Can we see the adductor magnus? Here, I'll go ahead and erase that so it's out of our way. Can you see the definition of the gracilis or the adductor magnus on the inside of this guy's leg? No. No. I mean, yeah. Eh. No, I mean, no, you cannot. <laughs> Better you cannot. than 
most people's likes. <laughs> True, but you're not seeing the strap like gracilis here. You're not seeing the, the muscles the same way we're seeing those other muscles. These other muscles have nice definition to them. Even on this bodybuilder, you're not seeing that midline um, that midline definition on these guys' legs because it's just, it's a part of the body that is really, really hard to work out and maintain tone in. And that's why it's not common. It's not uncommon for people like soccer players or people like baseball players or football players who are having to do a lot of twisting and, and turning motions for their, them to stress that muscle and, 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 and injure that muscle and get that groin injury. All right. Excellent. Um, so we did that, 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 done that. Excellent. It's always the little ones that are compensating for their size, right? Here we have this tiny little muscle called the tensor fascia laria. Big, huge name for this tiny little muscle. Notice, again, you don't have to know its origin and its insertion, but notice it starts at the superior anterior iliac spine, the same as the sartorius. So notice it comes down laterally while the sartorius comes medially and the rectus femoris is in between. No, we did the iliopsoas. Remember the iliopsoas is the iliacus and the psoas major and the psoas minor. That was that big, huge, massive leg flexor. We did that one. Yep, we've done a lot. All right. Tensor fascia laudia. Let's start easy. It is an anterior and lateral muscle that crosses the hip. So how many actions does it have? One, four, two. Which one? Okay, I've heard a lot of numbers. Which one's right? Oh, two. sorry, two. Two, excellent. Being an anterior muscle, what effect does it have on the hip? Maybe duct. No, well, being anterior does what? Flex. 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 Being lateral, what does it do? Abduction. Yeah, so it, AB it flexes and AB ducts the hip, right? However, as the name indicates, right, we often name things by their function. Tensor is something that puts tension. And so it must be putting tension in the fascia lata. So then the question becomes, what's the fascia lata? And if we look closely right here on our illustration, we get a sense of what this is. There is this big, huge sheet of connective tissue that wraps around the entire quadricep muscles of the leg this fibrous connective tissue sheet that wraps all the way around it. That basically acts to do two things. It stabilizes these big, huge, powerful muscles of the leg, but it also acts like a pressure cuff. When would somebody use or have a pressure cuff on their legs? Come on, What's a pressure cuff? Say again? What's a pressure cuff? Someone tell me, what's a pressure cuff? All right, let's ask the question this way. You hurt your back or you've got a big surgery or something like that and they stick you in a bed and you are bedridden closer. You are bedridden for a prolonged period of time. What do they wrap around your lower legs in particular if you're stuck in bed for a long period of time? Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So they, they wrap pressure cuffs around so that it like keeps putting pressure around, say like if it's around your ankles or your feet, or it's typically around your calves, it adds pressure, like a pressure, like a blood pressure cuff. And then it releases stimulating the blood flow to ensure that your muscles are getting the things that they need. Excellent. And yeah. not only getting the things that they need, but getting the blood out of the feet, out of the legs, back to the heart. Yeah. So congestion. Circulation. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Yeah, stops blood prevents blood clotting stops all sorts of damage and stuff that way by squeezing the muscle squeezing the blood sending it back to the heart so it doesn't get congested and that's what the fascia lata does not only does it help to stabilize the muscles of the leg but right especially when you're in anatomical position your legs are below your heart 
your veins have very low pressure blood and they need help getting the blood back to the heart. And so this fascia lata uh, helps to squeeze the muscles of the leg, stabilizing these powerful muscles, but also helping to move the blood back to the heart. Notice the tensor fascia lata is connected to the iliotibial band. The iliotibial band is actually a big thickened part of the fascia lata. If we were to take a cross section of the leg like that, uh, basically there is this big, huge connective tissue strip that wraps around the whole thing. And then there is an area where that strip is much thicker and that much thicker part is the iliotibial band. So notice by connecting to the iliotibial band, the tensor fascia lata puts tension on this band, which puts tension on the fascia lata. So they've cheated and drawn a little bit of here. Notice if the fascia was in place, we wouldn't be able to see the muscles underneath. But we see this really nicely, the model, oops, didn't mean to do that. The model, that's what I want to do. Does a nice job of showing this. Notice here, perfect. We see the tensor fascia lata, that anterior lateral muscle that connects to the iliotibial band. And then again, that fascia lata wraps around the entire leg. Notice this is another muscle Notice our pesky uh, bodybuilder here isn't showing us enough of his thigh. If he was wearing those like uh, those bodybuilder, you know, like tighties, uh, you know, uh, um, banana hammock type things, uh, we would be able to see a little bit more of his leg. But if you notice, if you look closely, this little bit right here, we can see a little bit of that tensor fascia lata that actually sticks out on the lateral anterior part. These muscles can actually get quite massive on a bodybuilder. If you do a, a web search for bodybuilder tensor fascia lata, uh, well, I'd, I'd be frightened what kind of things would come up, but I'm sure you'll find some good pictures. They get incredibly large and impressive. So it is a very, very cool um, uh, muscle that can be easily identified on the leg and tent. All right. And there's that picture for that. So I think Excellent, we're doing good. I think we have um, identified all the muscles of the upper leg, yes? Am I missing anything? Uh, for some reason, I don't have the insertion and origin um, written for the gastronemius. Have we covered it? We're going there next, but that's lower leg. So I just for the upper leg on the thigh, I think we've gotten everything. But you're right, that's where we're going next, the gastrocnemius. So uh, I think we are good with the upper leg. So let's finish the lower leg. Gastrocnemius. Gastrocnemius is one of the most well-known, but also one of the misnamed muscles of the body. This is what people very commonly refer to as the calf muscle. Do not use calf muscle on the exam. You will not get partial credit for that. You will get a zero for that. The correct name, which you need to spell is gastrocnemius. This is another muscle with the B specific. What does that tell us again? That yeah, tells us to freak out. And <laughs> left and right. Yes. Well, it tells us absolutely. It tells us that there's some precise piece of information you need. Typically that there are gonna be two, you know, two or more heads. And that also means two or more origins. Now, you got the right idea. We do have two heads here, but do we call them left and right? No, you call them medial or lateral. Mm. Medial and lateral, absolutely. So let's draw them. Let's take a look at what this muscle looks like when we draw it. Gastrocnemius, two bellies that sit right over the tibia side by side. So belly one, belly two. Of course, how do we identify or distinguish them again? Medially and laterally. Excellent. So which one is this one? That would be the lateral. How do you know? 
because your hip bone at the top shows that it's the outside of your hip, your lateral side of the hip. That is absolutely a perfectly acceptable way. However, notice also, this is also the side that the fibula is on. That as well. Yeah, so again, but yeah, no, I don't care how you do it as long as you do it, but absolutely, that's lateral. And so that makes this one medial. Excellent. So let's start with the origin of the medial head. What is the origin of the medial head? The medial condyle of the femur. Right. Now be careful. It's not the knuckle part, right? Because that's part, remember, that forms the joint of the knee and lets the knee flex. So where it actually connects, and again, if we had had the opportunity to see these bones in class, you would see that there's this little indentation right above the condyle, right like that, that is the origin for the medial head. Excellent. And what's the origin of the lateral head? The lateral condyle of the femur. Oh, oh, oops. Oh, no, that was pink. There we go. So they go up onto the femur and attach above the condyles. Of course, as we know, as with many multi-headed muscles, it is going to come together into a common tendon. Of course, this time we actually need to know the name of that common tendon. What do we call the name of this common tendon? Peritoneal tendon. Calcaneal tendon, absolutely. What is that calcaneal tendon also sometimes referred to as? Achilles tendon? Exactly, the Achilles tendon. All right, good old Achilles, his mom held him over the fire or held him in the lake of sticks, depending on which version of the story you read, uh, to basically make him, his skin, impervious to weapons but to hold him in the fire or to hold him into the lake sticks, uh, the river sticks, depending on, again, the version you listen to, she had to hold him by his calf and uh, as such his, uh, I mean, by his ankle. And as such, uh, basically that was his one week spot where he got shot at Troy and died. Excellent. And uh, where does this actually insert? The calcaneus via calcaneal tendon. Yeah, exactly. So again, the insertion, you just have to say calcaneus. I remember we don't need to know a bone feature of it, but back there on that big heel bone, we have that there. Excellent. How many joints does this cross? Two. 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 So the knee and the ankle. Let's start easy with the knee. Uh, crossing the knee, this is clearly a posterior muscle on the back of the leg. And so as such, what effect does a posterior muscle have on the knee? Does it flex? Dorsi flexion. Flexes the knee. Or plantar flexion. flexion. Now, when we're talking about movements of the foot, remember the foot movements are a little bit special. And the key to the foot movement is to think of it in terms of that C-clamp that is formed by the medial and lateral malleolus. With the medial and, metal, medial and lateral malleolus, basically muscles that come in and insert behind are going to pull the back of the foot up, whereas those that come in and attach in front of the medial and lateral malleolus is going to bring the toe up. This clearly attaches behind the medial and lateral malleolus. So it brings the foot up. And what do we call that action of bringing the heel up? Plantar flexion. Excellent. Plantar flexion. Whereas if you bring the toe up, what did we call that? That's dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion. Perfect. So. Notice for our gastrocnemius, there are two actions, flexing the knee and plantar flexing the foot. And 
again, if you're thinking of activities, and someone used this example in the last class. Remember, you were talk we were talking about that loves uh, that that you know that that first kiss, that true love kiss, right? I think about when you're having that true love kiss. What happens? The leg foot flips back, the toe points, right? And that's when you know it's going to be for heavily for happily ever after, right? Using that gastrocnemius. All right. Questions on that. Notice something about this gastrocnemius. This gastrocnemius is very similar to the biceps brachia. Notice the biceps brachia has two heads that sit side by side. It sits over the top of a bone but doesn't actually connect to that bone. It connects above it and below it. And it's big and superficial, sits on top. We talked about doing the curls for the girls so you can get the big muscles to show off. Well, it's the same thing with the calf muscles, right? If you're not happy with your calf muscles, you can actually get calf implants. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean the 90s, uh, there was a football player by the name of Chad Johnson, wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals, a truly amazing athlete with a great work ethic, uh, one of those people who truly had a 50-cent body and kind of a nickel mi mind. Uh, he was one of those, no, not like Brady. Brady's a putz. Um, but Chad Johnson went a little wonky. Uh, and he ended up, his number was 85. He changed his name to uh, Ocho Cinco, an incorrect spelling of 85, uh, you know, uh, and then changed his name back and everything else. Uh, a, a tremendous Twitter follow. If uh, you're interested in that, he's quite entertaining. But the point is he was incredibly strong, incredibly uh, powerful, and incredibly fast. In fact, uh, when he was uh, signed as a rookie to the Bengals uh, to show off his speed, he actually raced a racing horse and beat it in a race. Truly amazing individual. And one of the things he was known for were having these massive calf muscles. And there was a prosthetics company who actually paid him half a million dollars to make a mold of his calf muscles so they could make a prosthetic so that if you didn't like the size and shape of your calves, you could have calf muscles just like Chad Johnson, Ocho Cinco from the Cincinnati Bengals. And they paid him half a million dollars just for a mold of his gastrocnemius, right? Because again, as we've said many times in this class, it's all that's on the outside is the only thing that counts, right? Who cares about what's on the inside? It's only the outside that counts. So there you go. All right. So. Much like the bicep brachia, superficial, lateral muscles on the side, doesn't connect to the muscle. And if you remember, there is a muscle right underneath the bicep brachia, the brachialis, that helps the bicep brachia do the job. And the exact same thing is true here as well. Right underneath the gastrocnemius is another muscle known as the soleus, that helps the gastrocnemius do its job. Notice, and I'll cheat here by starting with the insertion, the insertion of the soleus is also the calcaneus bone. In fact, both the, the soleus and the gastrocnemius both connect to the Achilles tendon. And we'll see that when we look in the models, we'll see that when we look at the charts. However, what is different is its origin. What is the origin of the uh, soleus muscle? The head and proximal shaft of fibula and superior tibia. So basically it has this big kind of U-shape origin. And that comes back to its name. The soleus muscle gets its name from the sole fish. If you've ever seen a sole fish, it's a bottom swimmer and it is a broad, flat fish. Well, this is a broad, flat muscle. However, if you're going to get this broad, flat muscle into the small compartment, you have to kind of fold it up to get it in there. 
And that's what we see when we look at this great illustration from your textbook. Notice here, we can clearly see in the superficial view, the two bellies of the gastrocnemius, that big, nice, long calcaneal tendon into the calcanus. But if you look closely, sticking out from the side, you can see that flat soleus coming out behind it and also attaching to that same tendon. Notice here with them cut, we see those two origins, the medial and lateral origin of the gastrocnemius above the knuckles of the femur. And here we see that big, broad, folded up soleus muscle located beneath that gastrocnemius on the leg. These muscles help to stabilize us while we're standing upright. This Achilles tendon is the tendon that has the most pressure on it of any of the tendons in the body. Has anybody here ever torn their Achilles tendon or been around someone when they had their Achilles tendon tear, torn? Yeah, well, I haven't had it, but I know it's- there when It happened? Yeah. Did you know it happened when it happened? Uh, kind of. Okay. Just, uh, the, re the reason I ask is often, especially with a complete tear, there you go. The sound of it ripping is, it, it, it can be like paper, but it also can be like a gunshot. If it's a complete tear, it can sound like a gunshot. It can be loud enough where people can hear it over a hundred meters away. Right? You ask people who have had complete tears of their Achilles tendon, and uh, often they think they've been shot because they hear this long bang and they collapse to the ground, not fully understanding and appreciating what would happen. Right? When this tears, this muscle, like one of those old fashioned um, uh, shades, where you pull it down and it would roll up into the top, that can kind of happen to the muscle when that tears as well. You basically have to dig up there, grab it and pull it down to reconnect. And it is a very challenging uh, injury to heal from. Notice again, it is a tendon. So it's long, narrow collagen fibers. And typically when it tears, it tears across them. Is that something that's easy to be able to repair with that kind of a tear across the collagen fibers? Yeah, you see workout videos. Um, uh, uh, several, many years ago now, there was a, on Dancing with the Stars, there was a, 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 one, of the, uh, one of the stars on Dancing with the Stars uh, tour and you got to see it. There's all sorts, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, with the Nets now, um, what's his name? Mr. Basketball I'm sorry. Oh no. Who's the basketball player that used to play for the uh, Warriors and now is with the Nets? Oh, um, my husband would know this. Well, you guys know who I'm talking about. I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but he tore his Achilles tendon when he was out here with. Uh, I don't want to say it's Draymond Green. No, not Draymond Green. No, 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 no not Draymond Green. Um, um, I can't think of his name. I'm drawing a blank. But, uh, but you guys know who I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, he, he tore his Achilles when he was playing for the Warriors during the finals, right? So uh, again, it, it, and, and they showed all the videos and you could see the muscle jiggling and he only had a partial tear. Uh, so uh, it can often take years to repair from a complete one. And uh, even then uh, it can still uh, not be, uh, it can still not fully heal properly. Yeah. It's again, oh, there you go. Durant, Kevin Durant. Thank you. Excellent. I've got brain freezing on that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, so here's what I would say for mere mortals like ourselves, often an Achilles tendon injury, uh, especially a complete tear, never fully heals and becomes as strong as it was before. Now, again, for professional athletes like Durant, like some of the other players uh, um, that it has occurred to, uh, 
they have more sophisticated training and, and, and sophisticated doctors and sophisticated techniques that they're able to take advantage of because they're a little bit more expensive. And the technology has gotten better and improved where they're, rather than taking two years or never coming back or coming back in 10 months or, uh, you know, Adrian Peterson came back in 10 months from an Achilles ten, uh, tear that they thought would keep him out two years. But uh, I think that is more of the exception than the norm. All right. If I remember correctly, we only have one more muscle we need to do the origin and the insertion for. And that remaining muscle we need to do the origin and the, surface and the insertion for is the tibialis anterior. Now let's cheat. Hold on. I want to bring because we know bones are gonna be on the exam. Now would be a good time to bring up a bone. Like for instance, our tibia. Excellent. So I want that. And I guarantee you with 100% certainty, there are pictures of tibias on this exam. It is one of the freeing things, the, one of the few things that I like about this format, right? I have no idea what is gonna be on your exam. So I have no problem sitting here and telling you, I guarantee you there's pictures of the tibia on the exam. You should know that anyway. But uh, the point is, if you think about what's going on on your tibia, if you remember, we just learned today now, there's not one, not two, not three, but four muscles that insert into our tibial tuberosity. All right, all the muscles of the quadricep femoris insert into that tibial tuberosity. We also learned how there's not one, not two, not three, not, uh, but four muscles that insert into the medial condyle of the tibia, sartorius, gracilis, semimembranosus, and semitendinosus. That doesn't leave a lot of space for other muscles. So notice the tibialis anterior, which indeed is an anterior muscle, where does it actually originate? Lateral uh, condyle and proximal shock tibia. Yeah. Notice the tibialis anterior basically originates from here, right on the lateral side of the tibia, not to the tibial tuberosity, not on the medial side, but over here on the lateral side. But then what this muscle does is basically travels along the ridge and comes across to the medial side. And again, you probably haven't thought of it in those terms, but all you have to do is reach down to your leg and feel that. Because as you reach down to your leg, one of the things that you'll notice on the front of your leg is that there isn't a whole lot of muscle here. In fact, you have this big, huge, exposed uh, wedge-shaped piece of bone here on the side. And what do we call that? Like when you whack it into the coffee table at night because you got the lights off and you're trying to sneak around the house? Chin. 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 Absolutely. Right. So exactly. So there is that chin bone, right? When we look at the models. Notice here on the lower part of the leg, we have, oh, actually this one doesn't show it. Oh, bummer. I wonder if, uh, hold on, Demetri, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead and ask your question. So what, what would then be the shin splint? Then ah, we'll get wondering. to that in just a second. That is an excellent, excellent question that I promise you I'll answer in three minutes. Okay. Yeah, being a soccer player is sucked getting one of those. Yes, it does. All right, let's see. Not even they don't do a good job of showing it. All right, well, so we'll use the picture from your textbook. Notice, here we go. In the picture from your textbook, we see very, very nicely that exposed bone. 
So again, four muscles come into the tibial tuberosity, four muscles come into the medial condyle. So our origin of our tibialis anterior is over here on the lateral aspect of the tibia. But notice the muscle crosses the foot and actually inserts on the medial underside. So where does it actually insert? Medial cuneiform and first metatarsal bone. Yeah, so basically it comes down and wraps underneath the foot. So notice when we think of its actions, it comes to the front of the foot in front of the ankle. So it is going to dorsiflex, but because it wraps around underneath, it can also turn the foot so that the sole of the foot faces inward. And what kind of action would we call that again? Medial rotation. No, remember when I turn my foot so that I can see if there's uh, gum on the bottom of it, that is in inversion, inversion exactly. So this uh, dorsiflex and inverts the foot. All right, now let's answer that great question about shin splints. Notice as we've talked about, there is not a lot of muscles in this anterior compartment of the leg. It's pretty much the tibialis anterior by itself because of all this bone that's here. And like most of the muscles of our body, there are connective tissues that wrap around it and stabilize it in place. Muscle, as we know, is a very dynamic tissue. It can engorge with blood. It becomes inflamed and enlarges when it's exercising. It changes shape as it contracts. It is a dynamic muscle that is constantly changing shape and swelling and doing other things like that. However, it's wrapped around by a fibrous connective tissue. And do fibrous connective tissues change shape very easily? No. No, no, exactly. So that's the problem, especially if you haven't stretched ahead of time, right? Uh, stretching, one of the things that stretching helps to do is to help to loosen up those connective tissues. But if you decided after four months of sitting on the couch, right, because you've been quarantining at home that you decide you want to run half a marathon tomorrow and just get out and start running, what's going to happen is that muscle is going to swell, that muscle is going to enlarge, and it's going to get constricted by that fibrous connective tissue. And when it constricts it, it decreases blood flow to it. So it becomes congested with blood. It builds up lactic acid. It swells and it pulls so that every time you take a step, it feels like that muscle is going to rip off the front of your leg. Right? That is that shin splint. That shin splint is typically caused by the constriction of that connective tissue. One of the best ways to reduce the effects of shin splints is to stretch, to help to, uh, to uh, increase the size of that fibrous connective tissue, to help to improve. However, there are some people that no matter how much they stretch, they still deal with issues of it uh, for uh, a while when they first start. And some people where it never goes away. In some of those instances where it never goes away, one of the things they will do, and again, this is not a common treatment, but one of the things that they will sometimes do with people who have very severe, very chronic shin splints is they will actually go in and make an incision in that fibrous connective tissue to help to open it up and give a little bit more space and reduce that congestion. Again, it is not a common uh, technique that is done because there are some concerns that go along with something like that. But if someone has really severe uh, shin splints that do not improve, uh, that is something that can sometimes be radically done to help to facilitate. And in, in some cases is successful at stopping that, uh, those shin splints essentially immediately. All right, questions on that one? I think that means we just have two more muscles then, right? 
and they happen to be yeah. the ones right next to it. So again, notice, and we'll do it here so that it's nice and dark. Here we have that tibialis anterior going to over and to the front of the foot. And right next to it, we have our second muscle we are responsible for. That second muscle we're responsible for, notice sits right next to it. So we see it right here as well. Actually, see from the front, we see it the best right next to the tibialis anterior. Notice the tibialis anterior is going to the bottom of the foot on the medial side. But here we have a tendon that splits that goes to the different digits of the foot. We've seen something like that in the hand. Didn't in the hand we have a muscle whose tendon split to go to the digits? What did we call it in the hand? Um, extensor digitorum. Extensor digitorum. And notice here, this is essentially going to do the same thing, but this one, to get all the way to the toes of your feet, needs a longer tendon. So what do we call this one? There you go. Exactly. It is the flexor digitorum longus. All right? Flexor digitorum. Oh, pardon me. Extensor digitorum longus. What am I doing? Extensor digitorum longus. Extensor digitorum and extensor digitorum longus are not equivalent. Extensor digitorum is in the hand. Extensor digitorum longus is in the foot. But notice it comes to the front of the ankle, comes to the toes. So what are the two functions of the extensor digitorum longus? To extend. Right. Well, it extends the toes, and then it also lifts the toes off the ground. And what would that action be? Tiptoe. Dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion. Right. Remember, not tiptoe. That would put you on your heels. If you elevated your toes, that would put you on your heels. So you'd be standing on your heels. So remember that dorsiflexion is when we flex the top of the foot, and we're getting on our heels. All right. And that leaves us with one more muscle. What's a good color that's going to stand out from these others? Well, let's use purple. All right, purple it is. Um, notice right next to it is a muscle with a small belly way over here on the side of the leg. And notice it has a long tendon that actually goes behind the ankle and attaches to the lateral aspect of the foot. Again, we don't have to know the origin and the insertion, but following the tendon tells us everything about this. This is a muscle on the lateral side of the leg. What do we call that lateral region of the lower leg? What was the regional term for that? Uh, plantar region? Close, it was a P. Perineal, not perineal, uh, peroneal region. So this muscle is known as the um, fibularis longus or uh, not perineum, I got perineum stuck in the brain. Uh, peroneal longus, peroneus longus. Either of those are acceptable. Fibularis longus, because the fibula is on the side. Peroneal region of the leg. And notice because its tendon goes behind the ankle, when it flex, it's gonna bring the heel up. This is the one that puts you on your tippy toes. And what action is that? Plantar flexion. Plantar flexion. And notice this one attaches to the lateral side of the foot. So it's also gonna turn the foot so that the sole of the foot points outward and what it, so that everybody can see if I've stepped on, on gum and what type of action was that? Eversion. Yeah, eversion, or, there you go. So plantar flexion and eversion of the foot for the fibularis longus. All right. And I believe that's everything. There you go. That is all you have to know for the next exam. That's it? That's it. Piece of cake, right? Easy. Excellent. All right. So we did finish early. Uh, so here's what I will say. Uh, again, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. So let's do two things. Let's take a quick, uh, just a quick five, 10 minute break. 
uh, give people a chance that if you need to get a drink or go to the bathroom or do something like that, we'll have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and so let's come back. Let me go ahead and uh, clear this. Yep, everything. Absolutely. So if you ask the questions, I will answer as many of them as I can. So let's take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, let's come back. Actually, we'll just take a seven minute break. Uh, 3.55. That should give us restart. Uh, that way, anybody who wants to run screaming from the building has the opportunity to do that. But anybody who would like to stick around and ask questions uh, to make sure that you guys understand the information, I am happy to do that as well. All right. Excellent. Is it going to be? Is it going to be recorded? Uh, yeah. I'll yes. Yes, I will record it. I know it'd be it'd be it would be an encouragement to stay if I didn't, but I'll record it. All right, so yeah, so meet you back here in, in six minutes. So take a quick break, stretch, get some of the drink, get some of the eat, cry, whatever you need to do. And I'll see you back here in six minutes. All righty. We've got a little over half an hour left, almost 40 minutes. And I am happy to answer any questions you guys have uh, that will help you to be successful uh, on the exam on Tuesday. So again, this isn't for me to tell you what I think is important. That's what I do every day in class. This is your chance to ask questions about things you're not clear about. And hopefully we can make it clear so that uh, you could be successful on the exam. Do you mind going over like a little bit of like how it was to terminate um, the, during the first step? Sure, absolutely. So uh, again, it's one of the reasons why um, I think it's important when we talk about each step uh, that uh, you state the goal of each step. So what was step one again? A communication at the neuromuscular junction. Excellent, communication at the neuromuscular junction. And we said the goal of this is to what? Produce a muscle action potential? Yeah, absolutely. If we want to be a little bit fancier, we can really say we want to convert a neural action potential into a muscle action potential. But again, just saying that the goal is to produce a muscle action potential is perfect. However, if you think about it, really, this is the goal of when we want it to contract. So this is the goal of initiation, when we want the muscle to contract. So if you think about it, then the opposite is going to be true as well. If our goal of termination, right, if the goal of initiation is to produce a muscle action potential, then when we stop communication at the neuromuscular junction, we want to stop producing muscle action potentials. So again, I think one of the advantages of talking in terms of the goals is then we can see, all right, this then is what I need to do to turn it on. This is what I need to do to turn it off. All right, I need to do the opposite of that. So that's why I think there's an advantage to that. So there's really, if you think about it, and, and, and remember on the exam, I want you to go through every single step. But when it comes to understanding of it, if you think of it, there are some really big things we need to do. Obviously, the very first thing we need to do is make the decision to stop the contraction, right? When we make the decision to stop to the contraction, we stop sending neural action potentials. Right? So that is the very first thing. Why is that important? Because at the synaptic end bulb, that neural action potential was allowing calcium into the cell. So with no more neural action potential, there's no new calcium entering into the cell. Right. However, we still have to get rid of the calcium that is already inside. Is that where the calcium pumps come into? Exactly. That's what those pumps are going to do. And again, why is it that we need to get rid of that calcium? 
because what calcium is doing is causing the exocytosis of acetylcholine. So with no calcium, no new acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So no new neurotransmitter, but we still have that issue we have before. There is still acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft that we need to get rid of. And how many ways did we say we had to do that? There are three ways, right? Yeah, three ways that we did that. Exocytosis, diffusion, and uh, the acetylcholine esterase. So that once we get rid of that acetylcholine, the chemically gated cation channels close. And that's important because now no new sodium into the motor end plate. That sodium was a big positive signal. So there is no new depolarization, which allows our motor end plate to repolarize. And remember when it repolarizes, our muscle action potential stops. Now again, these are not all the steps in the way, but these, if you think about it, are the big key highlights, the big things we need to do to accomplish that goal of stopping the muscle action potential. So I think sometimes if you think of it in these big chunks, then you can uh, fill in the gaps, right? What is it about stopping the neural action potentials that causes the so calcium channels to close? Then as you pointed out, we use the pumps to get rid of the calcium there's there. You told me the ways that we get rid of the acetylcholine, right? And so on and so forth. So again, when you're describing this, make sure you're giving me all of the steps on the way. But I think if you think of it in terms first of what are the big things we need to do, then that will help. And here's the other thing that I will remind you about. There are not many, but one of the few advantages to this online testing format is that uh, there is no limit on your space to write. On a, <clears throat> on a paper exam, when I give you a paper exam, this question may have, even if it's two thirds of the page of the paper, that's all you've got to write it on. Yeah, you can move on to the back of the page if you really need extra space, but you're limited. With this one, you can write for as long as you want. So one of the things that you could do is actually start with just a brain dump. Write these big concepts, write these big notes, write notes to yourself, do your concept mapping. Any of those types of things you can actually do, right? I've had people ask for, for scratch paper and certainly you're not allowed to have scratch paper, but type on the screen write these things on the screen. So what you can do is at the beginning of the question, have all of that. And then what you can say at the top of that, if you want, or, or even that right here, right? You can make in big bold, you can say above are my notes. The answer starts here, right? And you can write that and that way you don't even have to bother erasing it. You can leave all your notes there to help you. And so you can say, boom, those are my notes. Feel free to ignore that, Dr. Sletsky. Just read the stuff underneath here because this is my answer starting here. And so that's something that you could easily do on the exam. I have a quick question regarding this. So I have a problem with not having things in the exact order that they happen. Is that something that is going to be affecting my grade? Yes. Uh, again, if you give me the steps of a process and you put them in the wrong order, then that process doesn't work, right? If you're explaining to me how to tie my shoes and you say, first you make one bunny ear, then the first bunny ear goes around a second bunny ear, then you make a second bunny ear, right? And then the bunny ear goes in the hole. It doesn't work that way, so it doesn't work. If you're describing a process, you have to have the right parts in the right order. Yep. Excellent. All right, next question. Those were two good ones, give me more. I wanted to, if, if that's okay, briefly go over the, the first three. So communication and then excitation um, coupling, 
reaction and then I'm kind of more certain on the first and third, but the second one, I'm not exactly sure about the excitation coupling. Okay, well, so here's what I would say. We spent a tremendous amount of time on that in class, and I actually even wrote them out specifically step by step by step. So I don't want to spend too much time on this part of the stuff, because that is stuff that you can easily access from the previous exams. And since we only have about 30 minutes left, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But we can do something similar with excitation and traction coupling. So again, instead of thinking of it in terms of every immediate step, which again is what I want on the exam. Let's think of it in broad picture what we need to do. Now, the nice thing is it's a much shorter process. And again, what is the goal? The goal is for myosin and actin in the next step to, to contract. Well, myosin and actin contracting is what the contractile cycle is, but you're right. We want them to be able to. So what do we need to do to be able to get the myosin and the actin to interact? There you go. Our goal of this is to move the regulatory proteins. All right. So let's work our way from the goal. Our goal is to move the regulatory proteins. What are the regulatory proteins? Tripomyosin and, and troponin. All right, excellent. Why do we need to move them? So the myosin binding sites can grab onto the actin. True, but, the, but why is it specifically that tropomyosin that we have to move? Yes, we want actin to bind to the myosin or myosin to bind to the actin, but what does that have to do with tropomyosin? It is, it's in the waves. Yeah. Tropomyosin covers the active site on the actin, stopping myosin from binding. Excellent. So that is our goal. We need to move those regulatory proteins so that myosin and actin can interact. Excellent. So the next question becomes, all right, we need to move the regulatory proteins. How? How do we move those regulatory proteins? The action potential starts in the sarcolemma and then goes down the t tubules. I don't want the steps specifically. How do I move the tropomyosin? Oh, um, you have to have a release of calcium for it to bind with um, tropomyosin. Well, it doesn't bind to the tropomyosin, but you have the right idea. Calcium binds to troponin. And when that occurs, troponin, because I like my fancy terms, undergoes a conformational change, which again, very, very fun to say, but we don't really have to say that. Troponin what? What can we say? Calcium binds to troponin, troponin does what? It's all changes shape. Changes its shape, exactly. And when it changes its shape, there you go. And that it exposes the binding site. Excellent. All right, so now we know how to move it. Of course, then we still have an issue. How do we get the calcium to the troponin? Is that where we release calcium into the cytosol? Exactly. We release calcium from where? From the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We release it from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. How? How do we release the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Isn't that when we produce, that's when we depolarize, right? And change the resting membrane potential? Right, we depolarize the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Specifically the terminal cisternae. 
And when we depolarize the sarcoplasmic reticulum, how does that let calcium out of the cell? I mean, out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because it, the two terminal cisterna in the, uh, was it the forms of triad, right? True, it is the triad. So we want to depolarize the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We want to depolarize the triad. But what does depolarizing the triad and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, those terminal cisterna, what does that depolarization actually do? It sends a big positive signal. It is a big positive signal, but what does the big positive signal do? What does that depolarization do? It opens the, the chemically gated channels. Would voltage -gated. Chemically gated? Yeah, there you go, voltage gated. Right, voltage gated ones are the ones that care about the membrane potential. Excellent. So there you go. We open those voltage gated calcium channels, releases the calcium. So then again, guess what question we're going to ask? How? How do we depolarize the triad? By having the muscle action potential spread down the, the transverse tubule and depolarizes the triad. There you go, right? Of course, then how did we get the muscle action potential or where did the muscle action potential begin? From the motor end. Yeah. Notice this time we worked our way back. We started at our goal and we worked our way back from the goal to figure out how to do it. Right. So when you put it all together, we start with the muscle action potential at the motor end plate, spreads down the sarcoloma, down the transverse tubules, depolarizes sarcoplasmic reticulum, especially the terminal cisternae, explain what the triad is, and opens voltage gated calcium channels. Calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. That calcium binds to the troponin, changes the shape of the troponin, rotates the tropomyosin, and now myosin and actin can interact. Right. Again, there's no wrong way to tackle this stuff. So like I said, one of the things that I've been trying to emphasize as we've been going through this is not just identifying the stages, but identifying the goals. Because when you identify the goals, uh, that is going to help you to focus in on what exactly it is that you need to do. Yes. So, well, again, on this topic, seven essay questions on this topic that there will be at least two, possibly a third from. But obviously we've got lots of other questions. We've talked about trepe, we've talked about uh, changing the tension in a muscle cell. We've now talked about a smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. There's plenty of other essay questions as well, but for the muscle contraction, at least two of those seven, if not more, will be essay questions. Laura, yes, you had a question? Um, yeah, it's probably a dumb one, but um, so well, I think- The question is the question not asked. I think this is where I or I'm or I'm getting kind of confused. So at this point, now that the tri tropomyosin exposes the binding site for myosin, is that where they start to prime, or is that something completely different? No, it's a great question. So uh, the short answer to your question is typically the priming occurs first, right? Because after all, we have the myosin, and the myosin has this myosin head that's hanging off of it here desperately wanting to grab onto the actin and pull on the actin. But that pesky tropomyosin is in the way. So it can't grab onto the actin. But what there's plenty of is ATP that is floating around. So while this myosin head can't grab onto the actin, it can grab an ATP. And remember, when it grabs onto that ATP, it is going to split the ATP uh, into ADP and a phosphate and energy. And it stores all three of those things. And when it stores all three of those things, that primes the myosin head. So now it's pointing away from the M line and it's ready to do work. 
So typically when a muscle is at rest, all of the myosin heads for the most part, because they've been sitting there waiting, are mostly primed and ready to do work. Mm -hmm. And so that as soon as that stupid regulatory proteins moved out of the way, they can grab and they can get to pulling. So would it matter if we were to put in between this step that it's primed or would that kind of so, be What's going on with the myosin head really isn't part of the excitation contraction coupling. Would I mark it wrong if you right now talked about the primed myosin head or in here talked about the prime myosin head? I wouldn't mark you wrong for doing that, but that's not really a part of excitation contraction coupling. The priming of the myosin head is part of the contractile cycle. And because the cycle is a circle, you can start about talk about priming it first, or you can talk about priming it last. Because if you think about it, whatever happens first becomes the last step as well. So because it's a circle, either way would be an acceptable way to talk about it. As long as it's in there, it can be first or it can be last because uh, it's a cycle, it's continuous. Okay. All right, I think we got time for at least one more. What else you guys got? Brain's finally full. Can you go over a little bit of what we talked about today about like the difference between like a skeletal muscle twitch and then the cardiac muscle twitch a little bit? Okay, so I'll tell you what, let's focus on the cardiac because that was the new part. Okay, so let's just focus on the cardiac muscle because that was the new, the, the skeletal muscle, that stuff we already talked about. Now, we already know one of the, actually, let's not even bother with that. We already know that one of the main rules that works for skeletal muscle works for cardiac muscle as well. And that is one muscle action potential reduces one twitch, all right? So we know that is a rule that is absolutely positively true for both cardiac muscle and for skeletal muscle. So of course, what that means is we need to talk first about a cardiac muscle action potential. Like all action potentials, this time I won't bother drawing it out. Let's not even bother drawing it out. Like a skeletal muscle, uh, the cardiac action potential has a fast depolarization and a fast repolarization. All right, so it has both a fast depolarization and then a fast repolarization. However, with skeletal muscle, that's all there is. With cardiac, there's a middle step. That middle step, something we don't see in the skeletal muscle action potential is that calcium channels open. And when those calcium channels open, we have a massive amount of calcium that enters the cardiac cell. Now, this is a good thing because we need the calcium to move regulatory proteins. Remember, it relies much more on calcium from outside. But the other effect of this is calcium is a positive ion. And when a positive ion enters the cell, it makes the cell positive. So as a result of this, the cell stays polarized, pardon me, stays depolarized for a much longer time. In fact, as we said, as much as 15 times longer than a skeletal muscle action potential. So when we stimulate that cardiac muscle cell, it stays stimulated for a much longer period of time. It stays depolarized, it stays excited and turned on, uh, for a much, much longer period of time. Okay. Now, as we know, one muscle action potential produces one twitch. 
So not surprisingly, if we have one long action potential, it is going to produce one long twitch. All right. Again, remember twitch is the three phases, latent, contractile, and relaxation. This lasts way, way longer. Remember in skeletal muscle, the twitch is eh, 20 to 100 milliseconds long. But in cardiac muscle, because we have a longer action potential, the cardiac twitch lasts around 200 milliseconds. It's depolarized for a longer period of time, so it contracts for a much longer period of time. And as we talked about, the advantage of that is that it produces a longer, more efficient pumping action. All right. And as I said earlier, we're not talking about some weak little boy trying to blow up a bicycle tire. We're talking about these big, strong women trying to fill up these uh, air mattresses, right? All right. You get this longer, much more efficient pumping action. Yeah, again, I apologize. I carried away and wasn't thinking about what I was saying. So we get a longer, more efficient pumping action. However, there's one more thing to remember. While we want that nice, efficient pumping action, we do not want to tetanize cardiac muscle, right? We want no wave summation to occur. Well, how do we make sure that no wave summation occurs in our cardiac muscle? Well, the way we do that is with the refractory period. In skeletal muscle, the refractory period is only about one to five milliseconds. Notice the shortest twitch in skeletal muscle is 20 milliseconds. So I can stimulate that skeletal muscle cell four times while it's still doing its first twitch. That allows me to add a lot of tension together really, really quickly to tetanize that muscle and produce that long sustained contraction. However, for cardiac muscle, the refractory period is 250 milliseconds, which is longer than the twitch. So it's done with the twitch and I still for another 50 milliseconds can't stimulate it again, right? I can stimulate that skeletal muscle 10 times at least in that time. Well, I'm, most construction, as far as I know, most construction programs don't require an anatomy and physiology component. Oh, wait, you're not a construction worker. You want to be an industrial hygienist. No, I'm not the one who sets the criteria. So. But think, here's the other thing that I would say. The other advantage to knowing this is you get to know your own body. I have many um, st former students and current students in some cases who come back to me saying, hey, my grandfather just went into the hospital or my mom went into the hospital and I was able to actually listen to what the doctor said and it actually made sense to me. 
right? If you think of all the times when a doctor has, you know, tried to explain stuff to you and it just goes over your head. When you know these things, it can give you a tremendous amount of understanding and therefore appreciation and, and, and awareness when you're dealing with these types of issues that can help that way as well. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was trying to kind of like make a bypass of joke. Like this is a lot of information. It is a lot of information. I agree. And not a, and not a conducive format for learning it, but yet here we all are. All righty. Did that answer your question about the action potential in the Twitch for this? It did. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. Excellent. Uh, we still have a few more minutes. So if you guys have one more quick one, we can squeeze that in. Uh, otherwise, if, like I said, if your guys' brains are full and you're ready to call it a day, I'm happy with that as well. I will remind you, uh, while I don't have any set office hours, um, uh, especially with this being a testing weekend, I will be available by email. So if you have any questions or concerns, absolutely, you can reach out to me on that and uh, I will do my best to be able to answer that. Uh, yes. Uh, question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have to, I'll take both of them. Uh, Dimitri, uh, so, so I know that you that you know you only showed us before the histology but we didn't really go over any of it because it's you know us being good sophisticated students we should be going over it in our own time um my question would be what would be for example um an example question you know for histology would you show like a picture of like is this striated or non-striated or stuff like that or is it going more detailed than that uh, so again you have a list that list actually tells you what's going to be on the uh uh, what's going to be on that. So you have a histology list to look at. What I would encourage you to do is to take advantage of all the resources uh, that you have to help you with this. And, and one of the best ones, uh, honestly, is, I mean, you have your, your, your master in A&P, you've got your textbook, you should have a lab uh, histology atlas and all of those things. But one of the things that, that I've seen that I am most impressed with is under the modules, uh, when you come to this Yale histology. When you look at this Yale histology, it is uh, uh, intimidating to see how much information I have here compared to what we're going. So for instance, when you look at muscle tissue, there's a whole muscle lab with learning objectives, keywords, many of which you need to know um, as you look at them. Some you may not necessarily need to know. You don't need to know what uh, functional sync to them is, but stuff like that, but plenty of other things. You don't need to know the Purkinje fibers yet, uh, but we have the introduction, different types of tissue, tremendous amount of information. And here's the fun part. Uh, not only is there a pre-lab quiz, but there are slides. And for these slides, you can just look at them in study mode, or you can look at them in quiz mode. So let's say, for instance, we were really interested in uh, looking at uh, that smooth muscle orientation, because I told you you're going to be responsible for cross section versus a longitudinal section. And lo and behold, here we have the slide. And on this, we can clearly see two layers of smooth muscle, one where the cells are more elongated and going this way, and one where the cells are more in cross section. So they have this that's really nice there. And if you notice also, there is a button to show labels. So you click the labels and it will show you all the different components of it. And so again, it is this really, really great uh, uh, place to come and look. So there's lots of resources here, lots of materials here to help you to understand and master this material. So what I, again, uh, as I've said many times, there is no one correct way to study for this class. That is one of the reasons why I try to provide as many different resources as possible, because while some resources will work for some people, not every resource is gonna work for every person. So I figure the more resources you have to help you to be successful, uh, the better, especially when there's stuff like this. Yes, there are things we have to pay for, like the textbook, like the histology atlas, but those are things that I know will help you to be successful. Right, and there's not a lot of other websites or things like that that I'm making you uh, sign up for, just focusing on the core components that will help you to be successful because there's plenty of free stuff out there that can help you as well. I have a quick right. question yeah, too. Someone else had a question, yes, go ahead. Um, so uh, we have some muscles that we are not able to observe because they're deeper, like on a model or on a picture, but we have them on our list. Does that mean there might be cut cut muscles where we could see the deeper, so we still wanna know the exact orientation of it in the body? 
Yes, absolutely. So, and we saw that when we looked at the models, we saw that when we looked at the illustrations, like for instance, again, uh, like with the leg model, whoops, oh, I don't have that up anymore. Um, hold on, where was it? Oh no, it was the, hold on, that's not what it was. It was in the model pictures in the, all right, hold on. I'm trying to do too many things at once. I'm not that clever. In the modules, in the lab handout, for instance, is a great example of the type of picture that I could show you to see the, um, to see the uh, short head of the bicep femoris. So if you remember when we were looking at this leg model here, This one, notice by removing the semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, by removing the long head of the bicep femoris, we were able to more clearly see that short head under here, right? There was the picture of your textbook that showed the vastus intermedius on the anterior view. So yes, on things like that, you uh, to show you a deeper muscle, I would either use one of the pictures from your textbook or a, a partially disassembled uh, model like this to, to show you those so that you would be responsible for them. Uh, the bodybuilders, you are only responsible for the superficial muscles. But even there, remember we talked about how the brachialis, while technically a deep muscle, the deltoid points right at it. So that's a deep muscle that you are responsible for on the bodybuilders. So, but. Okay, thank you. But as you saw also, I'm not going to be giving you the gracilis or the, uh, the gracilis or the, um, uh, you know, the uh, abductor magnus on the bodybuilders because they don't show up. You are responsible for the brachial radialis, but the other forearm muscles, I'm not going to make you be able to distinguish the, you know, the flexor carpi radialis or something like that on a bodybuilder. I will use obvious examples, and, and there are many obvious examples of these big obvious examples on these bodybuilders uh, that you can easily familiarize yourself with. And I've given you that nice handout to help you with that as well. All right. All right, that is it for the time we have. I wish you guys the best of luck. If you have more questions, please email them to me. I will respond to that. Uh, and like I said, I will be around this weekend to help. I do have office hours on Monday as well, although I wouldn't save all of your questions till Monday because that's right before the exam. But remember, I do have office hours on Monday. And for that matter, I have office hours on Tuesday before our exam as well. Uh, so that would be a great time to fine tune things. But again, don't save all your questions till then. All right, guys, have a good, safe weekend. Study hard, have fun, and I will see you next Thursday. Good luck on the exam.